painful. Here we are. Wasn't this is a pretty. Yeah. This was a pretty old one, but it's still cranking along. Okay, let's call our meeting to order. Um, roll call will show the three of us present, um, Tom and Rochelle and myself. Uh, no public hearing. We have eight things on the consent agenda. Anyone wish, well actually seven, there's one that's already pulled. Um, anything to be taken off? I had questions on 3.3. Okay. Did you say 3.3? They're just questions. Um, so um, I couldn't remember under this is on page 11 of the entire agenda the 129 um, there was uh, something to um, Brooke Krager for the Soquel Creek Weir project and I just wanted a reminder of what that was Taj will address that assuming it's for our flow measurements but yeah in the, in the mid 80s the district installed a a weir and over the last winter it it got eroded and so the the whole creek bed changed and now it's it's a barrier to passage okay and so we've met with um fish and wildlife and brook Krager and we're trying to you know decide whether we should repair it um you know modify it to make it less of a passage but it it's looking more and more like we just need to remove it. There's grant funding okay. available to remove it. We've met with, we've asked advice from the, the modeling TAC about the, the added value of that data, and it seems like the downstream gauges are more, okay. more critical than this one. It's served its purpose to get you know the calibrated model at this stage, but okay. going forward, I think it's going to be a real hurdle to try to keep it. So. Okay, we're so we're just up. making sure we're allowing for fish, fish passage now. That's right. Okay, and then maybe you'll know this one too. The only other one I had was on page 17. Um, was what's a Polaris Sportsman? Thousand dollar thing from Environ too. Is that the uh, ATV oh maybe that, that was used for the the test on the store on the drainage? It could have been the rental. I'm surprised that would be coming in this late, but um, we just didn't know I what think that it was. was a Chris, Christine item, wasn't it, it? It might have been. Yeah. Okay. So some rent, a rental for, is it a vehicle of some kind? Um, that what was pulling the. Yeah, it was pulling this thing for the drainage check. 
Oh, storm water. Storage in the drainage. They used an ATV to pull that thing around. Maybe. But Probably an ATV. We okay. They do make that. Well, we should have received this. This was placed on the credit card. This yeah. was charged I, on the credit card. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Right. I just, that was just another one in the same. We can get back to you. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, yeah. I'm just curious. We'll double check. Okay. Yeah, I'm not aware of that. All right. Thank you for clarifying the Weir project. Um, I'll move approval of the warrants then. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous. We go, all, go on to oral communications. So this is the time for anyone in the audience to address us on any item not on tonight's agenda. Uh, my name is Gary Rawlinson. I'm here because uh, I, uh, my parents own a property that uh, is subject to a sunset provision on a will serve letter <coughs> and I want to ask for the, uh, the board to put onto the agenda a request I'd like to make to have a, a short extension on the sunset provision. Uh, I found out about the uh, sunset provision about a year ago, immediately began all the process for constructing uh, a, a residence on the property. Uh, I've already submitted to the county. I have the county's corrections, but we're now getting to a point where there's such a short amount of time left that if we could have a, a short extension, then we'd be much more assured of being able to uh, get the project completed. Well, we can certainly put that on the agenda. Would you make sure that happens? Yep. That'd be fine. And we'll let you know when that's going to be scheduled. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. When is your uh, deadline, by the way? Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Any board uh, comments? <coughs> no. no. Okay. So let's move on to the board planning calendar. Yeah, I'll mention two things. Uh, the MGA meeting is this Thursday, 7 to 9 at Simpkins. It's kind of a light agenda. The main thing on it is the... Uh, semi-annual groundwater monitoring report and if the board likes i can agendize that for our next meeting it just hadn't come in in time before. i'd like that i think it'd be great yeah. okay yeah. so we'll put that on there yeah. and let's see and then the following wednesday so a week from tomorrow is the gsp advisory committee that's on the calendar also uh, in an overview just to catch everybody up give them the big picture view um, <clears throat> the mga is done with the first round of drafting minimum thresholds for most of the sustainability indicators. They still have storage to do. But what we're seeing is that really there's one driver and that's the seawater intrusion. Uh, so uh, protective water levels. Once you get that, you pretty much cover the rest, it looks like, except stream flows, which will develop uh, indicators for that, you know, kind of separately. That's it. And, and of course, these will change. We still need to give the, the ones that the target, the minimum, or the, the lowest thresholds, and now we'll look for the ones they'd like to, to aim for. So it's a continuation. One thing I would like to mention, the Water Resources Management and Infrastructure Standing Committee scheduled for October the 9th. I don't know if I've mentioned that, but I will not be here for that okay. meeting, so you'll need to inform the alternate. And I have one thing. Yes. So on the um, November, Mid County Groundwater Agency board meeting. I will be out of town. Um, okay. So I don't know who's the alternate. Carla. Is Carla the alternate? Carla, I'll let okay. Carla know. Um, okay. Okay. I'll inform her. Uh, special board assignments report and nothing new to report there just one or two items in red um, I think the AMI that is in red there the WDO slash AMI that'll be brought back next meeting uh, other than that I'm glad to answer any questions any questions just Tom? a quick one yeah um, the stormwater recharge thing was mentioned and I didn't know if there had been any change or it's just still the same as this like it's, they're waiting for change in ownership we never heard how that's going with seascape um golf yeah i haven't heard an update from okay. shelly so okay. that's okay. That's okay. i'm sure she'll provide us that as soon as anything else comment okay 
We move on to 5.3, quarterly organization-wide abbreviated status update. So who's up first? So um, I can report out for Shell or answer any questions. Um, I think they're really focused on bringing back to the board on October 2nd the continuation of the AMI WDO uh, nexus and trying to mm -hmm. solve that. And she's out tonight. So is Christine for that matter. Okay. Engineering, please. Not too much to report other than we are starting the uh, service area three to four inner tie project this week. They're they're now starting. Um, and any other questions? We're more than willing. Uh, a little update on the ammonia that mm -hmm. came in after this was published. Um, we're operating it and pumping it into the system. Um, it's stabilized at this point, but we do want to continue to watch it to see if it'll climb the chlorine dose. Um, that's indicative of elevation, continuing elevation of uh, ammonia. But at this stage, we are able to operate it. It, it, it. We did lose over half of the specific capacity. And that's gallons per minute per right. foot of drawdown, right. um, which is unfortunate. It went from like 15 to about six gallons per minute per foot, but still producing roughly 380, 390 gallons per minute. Not bad. So, you know, if, if it's sustainable at that rate, we can probably accept that. If mm -hmm. it continues to climb, we're just going to have to come back to you guys with a, a, a treatment option. Where is the ammonia level now? Is it low, medium, high? Uh, do we know? We've, we've blocked off the lowest level. Right. Okay. But is the ammonia that it's stabilized at, is it a low level, a medium level, a high level? Yeah, we haven't, since this last um, packer installation right. a setting, we have not sampled ammonia. Okay. We've been using the dose of the, hypochlorite right. as a right. indicator, but mm -hmm. it's probably in the works over so the next couple of weeks. Hypochlorite dose is automatically adjusted or used up in the, if there's more ammonia. Right. Okay. And we, we ha there's a state allows a certain limit. <coughs> when we approach that, we have to turn it off. Do we know where we are with respect to that limit? Um, are we close to it? Or? I, I think we're, we're about half of the limit. Okay, that's not bad then. So we still have some room. Remember, it took six months for it to yeah. uh -huh. actually show up mm -hmm. when we right. first started the well. So we hope it'll stabilize. Um, but we certainly did block off the lower screens, and that's the... Most big productive producing zone, right? Yeah. And if, for an, if in the worst case scenario, it can't, it, it's still producing too much ammonia, and we want to then look at treatment. Can you open up those oh yeah. lower sections again? Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks, Todd. Thank you. Thank you. O and M. Christine's not here. So yeah, she's not here. But Todd, you can. Our can answer any qu if you have any questions on that. I think the chrome six was the biggest. I mean, uh, the one. ammonia was kind of the big item on there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh yeah, the Main Street well. So the the stainless liner was successfully installed, and um, we are waiting for DDW to give us the green light. Mm -hmm. It did pass back T tests. Good. So um, not much more to say there, except we look forward to putting it back in service. Right. That will be um, excellent. You know, both th that well and O'Neill and Garnet are sort of the three wells that support that isolated zone for the surface water transfer, you know, before and after the transfer. So ideally, those all three would be online. So it's not essential, but... But the two of them, would they suffice? Uh, during, not during peak okay. pumping. Okay. Yeah, not next summer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. probably have a short fall. Right. All right. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Special projects. I'll just hit on two. Um, the first one is the district did release the initial study mitigated neck deck for the pilot project that we're doing. The pilot recharge well at Twin Lakes Church. So the um, official comment period began September 12th and it will close October 12th. 
On October 2nd, we will be having ESA here to accept public comment, and we're hoping to come back um, with the consideration of certification of that initial study in mitigated neck deck at the first meeting in November. Um, subsequently, we're also working a little bit on the basis of design, getting that effort so that our hope and intent is to drill the pilot well at the beginning of 2019. Uh, the other thing I'll note is the City of Santa Cruz and Sovel Creek Water District met last week. Um, it was um, based upon some discussions that we've been having with <laughs> staff and several of us attended the Water Commission meeting to get some coordinated efforts related to outreach of the second phase of the surface water pilot. So since that will be uh, in service testing of ho houses and homes and businesses in sub area one, we are getting our outreach and communication plan together so that we can do that jointly. And that's all I have. Any questions? No, thank you. Thank you. Finance, any questions so there? Just to give you a quick update, we're in the process of uh, generating refunds on the July, our G July and August bills, and uh, checks are going out to those customers who have closed an account but have a, a refund due them. So that's in process. We hope to have it all kind of done here. We were hoping for the end of September, but it looks like it may leach into the first week or so of October as well. It's about 20,000 accounts, I think, that we have to touch individually. Good luck on that. And for the accounts where you, the customer's still active, then it'll be applied to the next bill. Is that how it's going it'll to work? It'll be applied as a re, as a refund on their account, and they'll see it on their either their September or October billing statement as an adjustment. Any other questions? HR. Okay, pulling pulling triple duty. <laughs> uh, I, I really don't have too much to report. Um, other than what's on the written, but we would like to um, welcome some new folks that we have on board. It's been a kind of a busy summer in recruitment, as you can see. Um, we hired Jacob Arnold on August 27th. He's um, now in our customer service field um, department. We also hired a water distribution worker, um, and he replaces um, someone who left us to um, move on, and he started officially on September 10th. He's a water distribution worker one. Um, we are currently recruiting for the board clerk um, executive assistant position and um, we also had another resignation and have somebody in line with that. We had just completed a, a recruitment for the customer service field worker and had a couple of really good candidates on that list. So instead of going back out, we actually uh, made an offer which was accepted to another candidate. So we have him starting next month. And then don't forget about open enrollment. You guys have been um, receiving information from me, so if there are any changes, just please let me know. Did we get a decent number of uh, returns for the executive assistant board clerk position? It's open now, and it's got a healthy... Um, oh, October 5th. Healthy, yeah, mm -hmm. October 5th is the, the closing date for that, and so we'll be going through our screening processes after that. But okay. things, are, things are coming in every day. Good, yeah. excellent. Any other questions? Gen General Manager. Please. Great. I'll report on two items not shown on my list, but I do want to share. Uh, I know the board a lot of times hears the negative, you know, people's concerns and that sort of thing, but we also get a lot of positive feedback from customers. And there was a, there was a message sent to uh, Shelley Flock, Conservation Customer Service Field Manager, that um, it kind of struck me and I wanted to share it with you, so I'm going to give it a try here on my phone playing it through the mic. Uh, we did get permission from the customer to play it, so here we go. Hi, Shelly. This is Yvonne Zanis at 928 Balboa Avenue in Capitola. And I called earlier about an hour and a half ago that I needed help uh, to turn off my main water valve, that it was stuck. And I just want to say, Chris just left here, and he fixed it for me. And I was so blown away that someone came out. I know he was out in the field, but he just stopped by and he fixed it. And I just feel really warm feelings about Soquel Creek water. So I just want to say thank you, you know, to him. And um, thanks a lot. I'm a happy, happy customer. Okay, bye. <laughs> so I think it's nice to hear good, no good news occasionally like that. 
The other thing I'd like to report on is, um, you know, down there in Monterey, they had uh, a court order to get off the Carmel River. So they had to reduce their take by half off the, I think it was half off the Carmel River. And, you know, what's an area to do? So they looked at a couple options. Uh, desalinization was their primary option with a backup of uh, uh, Pure Water Monterey. And, and since that, it's flipped and Pure, Mon Pure Water Monterey is their number one option and they're in construction on that. And the supplement to that is uh, desalinization. And last week, uh, the Public Utilities Commission, because Calium's private, uh, voted 5-0 to move forward with that project. Uh, but uh, the CPUC agreed um, Calam needs to explore the potential of even continue to expand that uh, recycling plant too. So um, I think that's good news for them. In relation to us, it, it I'm not sure, but I would think that may put a little bit of pressure on um, deep water desal a little bit, but that's yet to be seen. I'm, I'm not, you know, so it might be some implication there. Uh, and that's, that's all I have to report out. Any questions? No. No public comment? All right, District Council. Yes, a um, couple of things. Well, right now SB 998 is still on the governor's desk. There's a lot of lobbying going on. That's the, that's the bill that would change the way you handle turnoffs for non-payment and creates all kinds of wonderful things that Leslie just really wants to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, she has not enough to do in right, her job. Right. Right. We also resolved the, the John Cole case before the last hearing. It was, he was scheduled to go in and start arguing again about the way fire rates are, are uh, calculated and it looked like it might be prolonging the matter even further, so we reached a resolution where we just adjusted the one two inch rate. Everything else stays the same. And uh, again, I lo unloaded another workload on Leslie, but I, I think it'll be a lot better than waiting through September, or October, or November to find out what the, what the answer is. Um, and other than that, oh, um, the county had originally indicated that they would not give us an exemption from building and planning for putting in antennas as part of the AMI procedure. Um, I was able to find a, a county council who was willing to listen and we discussed it and she concluded that it was exempt uh, based on some cases. So. We got past that one as well. Excellent. Any questions? All right. We move to 6 2. Presentation by Raffatellis. So tonight we have Sanjay Gower from Raffatellis Financial <laughs> Consultants, and I've prepared a memo. You, you've had a chance to read it, um, but I, I, it reiterates a lot of what he's going to go through in his presentation. So I'll go ahead and let him walk us through all of the details. Were you able to get it up, Sanjay? Yep. Thanks. Okay, President, um, board members, staff, and public, I'd like to um, do our presentation associated with the rate design study. Um, as you recall earlier on in our presentation, when I've been here before, we talked about different steps associated with a rate study. There's the first step, which is our, what are our goals and objectives, what do we want to achieve. Second step is what's the financial plan, how much cash on an annual basis do we need to generate to fund our capital projects. Um, that was when I was here last, we talked about that. I'm gonna do a quick overview of that. Then after that's um, part of the study, the next part is called what we call cost of service, which is really about how do we divide the pie? So we know how much revenue we need to collect, how do we allocate the cost, and what's the appropriate rate structure? We do this for a couple of reasons. First, for transparency. This is a fee-for-service. We want to tell our customers these are our cost structures. This is how we charge people. Second reason we do this is because of Prop 218. Um, it's required, <laughs> so we do that also for that reason. So um, we we'll go over the cost of service, and then after the cost of service, the last, the second to last step, excuse me, is the rate design. It's actually the rate structure. What are the rates? I'm going to show you two options associated with the rates, whether they're two-tiered or uniform. This is where we are right now, so we definitely want to get your inputs associated with that. Um, and then the last step, of course, of a rate study is 
um, the administrative record and the public hearing. So today we're talking about the cost of service. I'm going to touch briefly on the financial plan, cost of service, uh, how do we allocate costs, rate design, and then also I'm going to talk about customer select towards the end. So right when you feel a bit tired, overwhelmed, I'll be doing that and go over customer select, and then um, briefly on some emergency rates and some options associated with that. So the financial plan overview, just to remind ourselves, we last time we came here, um, we presented basically two scenarios about how, what kind of revenues we need to collect on an annual basis. As you note, I used the word revenue, not rates, because we're talking about the amount of revenue on an annual basis. And basically what our recommendation was is that if we got grants, um, we're hoping to get $45 million worth of grants, we would then issue $52 million. Um, and then the revenue adjustments that we would need would be a 10% the first um, fiscal year, <coughs> then 8%, and then eventually two 6%. Yes? I was wondering, you know, that scenario one, the first year we bump it up to 10%, and then the next year we bump it back down. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, couldn't we pretty much do the same revenue thing by doing a 9% and then another 9%? Would we it make big a difference? We could look into it. The reason why we did 10 um, is, I'm going to just go right over here, I believe is because of the coverage ratio, but I'm looking at the slide right here. So the, the top is the increases, yeah. the green line is the coverage ratio, and the red line is the requirement that we want to be at. So you do have some wiggle room there. So we could look at a nine if the board would like. So we can do two nines um, to smooth that out. That'd make it a little easier on the customer. Yeah, it'll make it a bit easier. So we could definitely look at that. Sometimes That's what good. does happen though, um, because I've had to throw these numbers in there in the past, that 10% is to get us over kind of a hump because it's cumulative. So when you do a 9%, sometimes we're not always meeting our debt coverage ratio or our reserve targets, and it takes that little bit of oomph to get us there, and then we can drop back okay. on. Okay, well, if, if that could work out, though, that'd be nice. And similarly, on scenario two, we do 10, 10, 10, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8. And so the, the third 10 there and the first 8 could be 9 and 9. So that would be another nice thing is to, you know. Yes, we can. But we I don't know why all the rates here are even percentages so that if we can do there's m multiple solutions here there's, okay. a, there's not one solution okay. here i mean there's you know we could yeah <laughs> there's so a lot of solutions here scenario so. 10 2 could be 10 10 9 9 8 8 8 you know it'd be a more gradual kind of a change mm -hmm. so 10 <coughs> okay and 10. just something that i thought we should consider yeah we can look at that So scenario one, as I mentioned, is if we receive grants. Scenario two is if we do not receive grants, then we would be doing um, quite a bit of debt issuance, 95 million. Remember in scenario two, we we're also postponing some uh, repair and replacement to smooth out the rate increases. Um, so it's not as dramatic. It's still you know, 10, 10, 10, as mentioned, but um, we're trying to shift that project so we don't have such a dramatic increase. And then we also did a revenue adjustment gap, gap revenue adjustment, where if there was a delay in any projects, um, what would the re increase need to be? So um, this is a, a presentation that I showed last time, our slide, where the top is the adjustments that's needed in revenue. The bottom is the ending fund balance, the green bar, the green line, excuse me, is your target reserves, and the bars are the ending balances. Um, sometimes these balances are a little bit big because of pr bond proceeds that you may have, the issuing debt, and there's some proceeds, um, residuals there. So you see that. This is the one without grants. Um, as I mentioned um, last time I was here, there is a debt issuance out in 2024. Most likely, if you did do this one, you wouldn't need that debt issuance. But again, this is more of a planning purpose. This is not exactly how you'll implement it. Because as you do this, you'll be implementing it and, and seeing how it changes each year. So once we figure out how much revenue we want to collect, the next step is what we call cost of service. What we're really asking ourselves is what's the cost of service? And what I l we like to do is, is we like to break the, co the revenues that we want to collect into these different buckets. So we have what's the supply cost? So those are your wells. You have a base delivery. That's the infrastructure needed for wintertime average use. We have conservation program. We have extra capacity, that's the peak summer use, that what's the additional facilities that are needed for peak summer. We have meter maintenance, the cost of maintaining meters and replacing them, and we have customer service. 
we break the cost into those components. As you notice in the bottom, I've also sort of identified how we should collect that. There are some policy options here about how we can collect it, but typically supply base and conservation are considered variable and extra capacity, meter maintenance, and customer service are considered fixed. So these are your actual costs um, based on the revenues that we need to collect with no rate increase. So one thing I would definitely emphasize throughout this whole presentation, I'm not talking about that 10% increase. I'm just doing an apple to apple. This is how much you're collecting currently with your rates, and this is the new rate structure. So we have an apple to apple comparison. Once we've got direction, yeah, this makes sense, I like this, or maybe not like it, but I can accept it, I should say, then we can say, okay, let's put the revenue adjustments, then we marry the two things together. So this is collecting $19.7 million. Residential will collect 16.4. We've identified the supply cost, the base delivery, the max day, max hour, that's that peaking component, fire protection, both for public and private. So we identify what the cost is for fire protection, both for public and fire, private, and then we allocate that based on how many hydrogens, um, not uh, um, hydrants. Hi, 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 hydrants. Hydrants. hydrants, thank you, <laughs> I said hydrogen. <laughs> hydrants, thank you, and, um, and private fire lines there are. We allocate it between those two, meter, meter maintenance costs, customer billing and customer service, and then the water reliability. Mm -hmm. Why is the max day and max hour fixed? That would seem like variable to me because as we get more customers and mm -hmm. they use more, then that the max day and the max hour should go up, shouldn't so, it? So we're being consistent with your current methodology with your rate structure okay. where you have different meter costs based on customer class, mm -hmm. based on their peaking. So we had a dial dialogue about what is the appropriate and we feel like it's best to keep the current methodology that we've okay. developed. All right. So is the interpretation of the max day and max hour peaking, this is the cost uh, for having um, users that use, you know, a, a fair amount of water. So if, if, if use was low, that number would go down? Is that the? It's relative to how much you use relative to your low. So it's not a, it's a relativity. So it's, it's a comparison between winter and summer. That's how we're looking, because we don't, I mean, we don't measure max hour, right? I mean, we don't know, we don't have, you don't have AMI. So what we're using as a proxy is the seasonality between summer and winter. But with the seasonality, if let's say that, that all our users were to plant apple trees, say, you know, so that then this, this max day and max mm -hmm. hour peaking cost would go up because there's more demand in the summer. Correct. Okay. And so it depends on which customers are causing it. So we've done some analysis. What we, what we, our analysis determined is, is that single family, residential and commercial actually peak very similar. So hmm. we're suggesting that they should be one customer. They should have the same meter charge. Irrigation um, is very different. Sure. So they should have a different meter charge. So, um, so right now we're gonna look at the traditional rate options associated. Um, so one of our recommendation is to increase the fixed charge slightly, going from what your current 35.65 to 40.60, so we're seeing a slight increase in the fixed charge. <coughs> um, we've also examined um, the peaking characteristics, as, as I mentioned, between your different customer class, and what our recommendation is is basically have two different meter charges one for irrigation and one for all other, which is single family, multifamily, and commercial. Mm -hmm. So the 40% there, the mm -hmm. is that because the peaking has changed or why exactly is that? That's more of a policy in the sense of how much you want to collect yeah. from your fixed and variable. Okay. So there's different communities, as you know, Santa Cruz, for instance, has a lot of variable, l very low fix. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's someone else right next to you that does the exact opposite, that has a much higher fix and lower variable. But we don't have any data to justify that, or that's just a policy change. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, there is, there is, there is, in my professional judgment, there is some bandwidth of where you can go. There, of course, there's outliers where it won't be necessarily acceptable, but there is some, you have some flexibility. I, is it I'm to stabilize, just stabilize income? So to stabilize our revenue stream a little bit, yeah, with that fixed 
And we ran several scenarios, like the, the higher fix you go, it, it can conceivably hurt the, the low water users, right? So we ran scenarios on 50% fix, I think the diff different ones down the, the, you know, in the range, and then we tried to look at what would probably be most acceptable, suitable, best for the customer. So and, and if, it, if it stayed at 35, 65, how much of a difference does that make for a customer? It was only a in cost if they use the I same would, amount. Um, I would say a few dollars, but I would have to get back to you okay. about that. I mean, the the g objective here is is that there's a desire to increase the fixed charge just from, be, from the district perspective because of revenue stability, because of low water sales, because of drought. Now, the challenge, though, as we all know, as Ron's mentions that, is that if we increase the fixed charge, those individuals who use very little water will see a significant impact. And then the conservation message, affordability becomes challenging. So be given that, what we're recommending is a slight increase. So that's why we're not doing something more dramatic, even though there's a desire to do it, but because of that balancing act. Yeah, there's, an, I, there's another effect here too, that you know the vacation homes, which for month after month after <coughs> month, you zero, 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 right. this makes them pay a bit more into the system than they do now. That's so. true. Yeah, and, well, and I, I would just add issue, there's a fairness right. issue, right? That it gets closer going to forty percent fix gets closer not at but closer to what our true fixed cost is. So we're we're inching that way. Mm -hmm. It's around what, seventy percent our fixed cost? Ninety. Ninety. It would be more like okay. ninety, ninety five. Yeah, yeah. You don't have a much variable. Your yeah. variable is electricity. Yeah. But yeah. So of course you wouldn't I mean that's very extreme. Right. Because then you're yeah. Is there an interplay here with uh if we go to tiers, just in terms of increasing the fixed costs, Correct. if there are two tiers, the lower tier still would be paying less. That's if it's one, one tier, the increase in the fixed costs would have more of an effect on the, the lower user. Exactly. Okay. So that's something that we have to balance out. So we have to look at the whole picture. But that's a great observation. So this is the uh, meter charge right over here. I'm gonna look at my slide because I don't have eagle eyes. Um, so first that you'll notice is that single family, multifamily and commercial, um, the proposed rates are all the same. Only irrigation is different. Second, um, we um, had a lot of discussion internally about what's the appropriate ratios to use for the meter charges. Um, what we're doing is, is we're using your ratios. So we're actually looking at specifically at the meters that you have installed in the ground. Um, what that does though, is that it does charge, it shifts the cost to the larger meters. So if you notice, for instance, if you look at commercial and you look at a six inch, which is very large, right? Now remember, this is without any revenue adjustment. We're not, same amount of revenue you'll notice that the six inch proposed is $2,432, while the current is $2,276. So there is an increase there. About 10%. Yeah, for the six inch. And then you can see that for the eight inch. Now there isn't that many six inch and eight inches. Um, I should know how many there are, but I, I don't have that information at the top of my hand. Four? A handful. Handful, yeah, yes. Handfuls, right? But one thing you will notice is that um, one of our concerns was is the 5 8 inch, which we highlighted here, which is the most predominant customers. If you look at single family, currently it's $32.95. It goes up to $36.62. <laughs> so this is that increase, as I mentioned. We're increasing the fixed charge. So you do see a shift from that. We're looking at your specific ratios. So that, that does shift, and we're collecting the same amount of revenue. Is there any question here? I know there's a lot of data here and a lot of data points. Okay. I think that's a, that sh it shows the answer to your question, uh, Hugh. It's about three and a half dollars more when we go from 35 to 40 percent fixed uh, right. for the five eighths. There it is. Yep, yeah, there it is. Now, one of our concerns was um, on the single family residential side of things. Um, in the past, um, we have made a policy to make all uh, single family residential customers service meter charges the same. And um, Sanjay is recommending that we use the flow rate in order to be consistent and equitable with what we're doing with other customer classes. 
and that will increase the charge of the uh, fixed service charge for some of our uh, larger meters for single family residential. We have about 300 accounts that will be impacted by that. So that's specifically the one inch meter, if we look at the current, it's $32.95. Um, the proposed will be $82.12. <coughs> that's not for apartments? No, we've, we've got family. about three different type of customer profiles that are on a one inch meter that are single family residential. Some of them, some of them are simply older homes um, that had a one inch meter installed at the time the home was built. Um, we have some of them that are actually duplexes because remember our duplexes are treated as a single, single family residential unit. Um, they don't go to a multifamily until they get three or more dwelling units on a parcel. So some of those are, are duplexes. And then we have some customers who uh, had a one inch um, meter installed in order to accommodate fire flow. Now they're not charged a separate fire service charge because they only have a single one inch meter, but it serves both their residential use and potential fire flow use. So we're trying to come up with mechanisms to help mitigate the impact on, on those customers. What would it cost some, one of these customer classes to replace their meter with a, a five eighths, say? If, they, if, they, if you have a one inch or even worse, a one and a half inch, and they want to not have to pay that extra charge. Yeah, so a meter is around $300 when we're talking in this range of five eighths and then an installation. So that's the kind of thing where I think we could do the cost analysis for them. Okay. And uh, the fire service people where they're kind of stuck with a one meter because it's serving both and it looks like Taj has some ideas here where we're working well we're working throughout those classes to try to make it fair I guess for them so we have some ideas floating around I just had a couple of questions there, there was a whole series of housing that went out <coughs> in the jewel box where there were four plexes with a one inch meter and so if they're fourplexes, they're actually falling under multifamily residential accounts. Okay. Yeah. But they, they do have a one inch meter there. Okay. And then and the other question was, it was Sanjay before I forget. So are we using, are you gonna use flow for fire services too? Yeah, we're, I'm gonna talk about fire service in a second. Okay. Yeah. And Taj? Oh, I had a question too. I think Ron hit that, hopefully you heard him. He said some of those uh, homes that have one inch meters that have fire sprinklers, they have to, we have to leave that in. They, they have no way to downsize that meter. However, there is a possibility that we would classify them as maybe a standard single family. Uh, but those homes eight. are not paying for a fire meter. Then. That's right. So they may actually be paying less by having a single one inch line. No, I don't know about still that. It's still higher in the, in the proposals we're looking the, at Those here. are monthly charges? Mm -hmm. Right. But then there are those homes that are that have one inch meters that don't have fire sprinklers that those could definitely downsize. Yes. Okay. And, and let me reiterate and Sanjay correct me. These are the um, proposed but without the uh, rate increase on top mm -hmm. of them to keep it apples. Okay. And how many one and a half inch meters si single family residents do we have? We don't have any one and a half inch meters. Okay. We've got some three quarter inch and we've got some one inch. We should just take that off the spreadsheet then. Because that's not a problem. Yeah. Let's remove that if it's not. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's just, it's in your I current mean, it's rate five structure. Times yeah. Increase, yeah. Yeah. Nor do we have any eight inch single family residences either, so. It's just off. Yes. Yeah. And what's the, uh, so the single family residents and the multifamily residents are going up for the smaller meter sizes. Um, actually for all of them but the uh, commercial it goes up for the f 5 8 restricted but goes down for the ho for the larger sizes and looks like the irrigation goes down as well so until you get up to the two inch range yeah so what's so there's two things going on. Yeah. One, it, oh, well, three things going on. First, we've increased the fixed charge by 40%. Second, we've looked at the actual peaking that occurs um, between these different customer class, and we applied that. In the past analysis that you did this rate study, 
um, it was determined that commercial actually peaked more than single family and multifamily, so that's why they were higher. Based on our analysis now, it looks like single family, multifamily, and commercial are similar, so they should all pay the same. Third um, thing that's changed is the meter ratios. We're actually looking at the ratios that you have in the ground. We're not using the AWWA standards. Okay. The last rate study we had done was just at the cusp of the drought response that we were seeing by our customers, and now Sanjay has the benefit of some some data post drought mm -hmm. that's showing that these customers are not peaking as much as they were in the past. Mm -hmm. So next is um, the tiered rate structure. Um, we had a lot of dialogue about what's the appropriate tiered rate structure, how do we justify tiers, what's the logic with the tier with. Um, one logic that we, that we discovered or thought about is a two-tiered rate structure where we look at the amount of water that you have for the basin for pre-recovery levels. So that's um, 2,300 <coughs> acre feet. We allocate that to every account and put that into a monthly basis, that's basically six HCF. So the logic here is, is that if you use six or under, you're, you know, in some sense, part of the solutions, uh, cliche here, or you shouldn't pay for whatever it's needed for the water reliability. Right. And once you go above that, then you're causing the district to find a solution to the groundwater. So there's a logic here, that's a number. We've had a lot of discussion internally about that. Um, so our recommendation is that single family and multifamily it are similar in the sense of the indoor needs, at least, right, for household size. Um, the, the number of people in the house <coughs> are very similar between those two. So we recommend having those as a similar tiered rate structure, two tiered. Now multifamily, of course, will be based on number of units. So if, if someone had a 10 unit, their tiers would be 60. If someone had five units, then it would be 30. You would multiply by the number of units. And then for commercial irrigation, recommending them to be uniform like your current rate structure. Now, one thought about our multifamily is that um, they don't have any landscaping. Mm -hmm. And so wouldn't that change their, their peaking? Because uh, that kind of is the difference between winter and summer. You, so you'd expect them yeah. to have no peaking. Yeah, based on our analysis, we saw some peaking that's similar to single family. I mean, the, the thing is your single family people don't peak. <laughs> so that's why. They're similar to, because people just don't use much water. You have the lowest GPCD in California. Mm. So. And proud of it. Yeah, so that's the, you know, okay. so they're very similar, you know, in the sense that everyone's doing indoor needs. And while some of our very large um, multifamily complexes are on a separate irrigation meter, we have a lot of triplexes and fourplexes mm -hmm. that that's maybe not the case. They don't have separate irrigation. So that's kind of contributing a little bit to a uh, dynamic that looks very similar to single family residential. Okay. So the, your d definition of peaking is summer use to winter use. So you have a customer who uses 20 gallons a day in, in winter and 100 gallons a day in summer mm -hmm. so that'd be Five. high on your peaking because it's a ratio and you have another customer who's using 100 gallons per day in the in the winter mm -hmm. and 200 gallons per day in the in the summer and they they wouldn't be high in your 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 ratio but you're taxing the, the system more with the customer who starts at 100 and goes to 200 than you are the one that starts at 20 and goes to 100. Correct, we, we take into account both factors. One is how much you peak and how much water you use. Okay, so you are. Yeah, so we do this on a customer class, so we don't do it on an account level. Sure. Because it, it's, it's really ultimately how much water is needed, not what the ratio is. Yeah. That determines how you have to size Correct. the system and yep. et cetera. Yeah, I mean, you can peak a lot, but you don't use that much water, so then it doesn't really. I think that's where the tier structure comes in, right? Is that what you're? No, that's at? the meter ratio, the meter charge. No, but if you go from 100 to 200, your peaking is not as great, but you'll be in the, the tier 
two structure, so you'll eventually pay. Yeah, the tiered structure though is just six units, so it doesn't. It, it's re, it, the, we're putting all the peaking costs on the meter ratio. I mean, as it says, the peaking is just on a whole class right. basis, not yeah, on, a, on the individual. And you could do it the other way, have Correct. each customer in its own class, depending on literally their peaking, but we don't Correct. do that. Yeah, you could do that if you want. Mm -hmm. So um, what, um, I'm sorry, did I, <coughs> so we talked about this slide. So the next water reliability, um, reli water reliability is estimated to be $5.7 million. We worked with staff in determining what the appropriate amount for that is based on the budget. This cost is to incur, to improve the long-term health of the groundwater basin. Um, the argument here is that that cost should be recovered in tier two. Where do things like the water quality, I mean, your Chrome 6 and things like that appear? So water quality would be um, under base delivery. Okay. Or it would either be base or supply, <coughs> yeah. which in some sense doesn't matter because they're both a unit rate. Right, right. And same thing, conservation, we're saying everyone should pay for it. This is just the additional cost for um, improving the basin. I would think, con I mean, in the past we had conservation in its own tier because it was mm -hmm. something you had to do conservation when you were overusing your basin. Right. And we could do that. Um, when I show you the results, <coughs> then you can think about whether you want that or not. And, and that could be an uh, analysis that we look at. Um, so we have two basically um, classes, a two tiered for single family, multifamily, uniform. We have three components associated with the rate structure, which is supply, base delivery, and water rel reliability, <coughs> which is supplemental. Now these are the rates. So what we have, let's focus on residential. We have zero to six, and then six and above. I show you how much HCF we're estimating to be sold um, in each of the tiers. We have the supply cost, which is $3.68. We have the base delivery, which is $1.28. And then we have the reliability. So the $5.7 million is being recovered in the six and above units. As you know, there's not that much water in that because again, you've done an excellent job not using water, but that cost needs to be recovered by those individuals. So that unit rate is a bit high. It is $23.74. That was a concern, so we, that's why we examined it and we decided to put conservation in all the tiers. Because <coughs> if we did put conservation in the reliability charge, I believe it went up to more like $28. So it increased it by $5. Hmm? I'm confused. Mm -hmm. If I'm using 10 HCF, I'm also paying the tier one all the mm -hmm. way up to Correct. six. And so supply and base should <coughs> already have been paid for by my tier one usage and my tier two usage from six to 10 uh, should just be the reliability, shouldn't it? N well, this is just a unit rate. We just divided the total cost by all the units. It's, you're, you're not covering all the costs. We're saying supply and base is a unit rate. It costs $3.68 for each HCF. For each HCF, okay, I see. So we're not, it's not, once you, you know, you go into tier two, then we still need to cover it. Okay. If we did that, then um, tier one would go up yeah, um, right. much more. So as you can see, tier one is um, $4.97. Tier two is $28.71. Again, this is without any increase <coughs> in revenues. Okay. Um, the non-residential, um, as you see, their supply and base are the same. The water reliability, of course, is different, it's $4.55, because we're putting that across all the units. Everyone's paying for it in all the units. There's no tiers. So then it's $9.52. If we put the water supply, uh, water reliability in all the tiers for non, uh, for residential, excuse me, it would be again, it would be $4.55. So it would also be $9.52 if we did a uniform rate. So just to give you a frame of reference, um, the non-residential uh, uniform rate right now is $10.40 a unit under stage three emergency rates. The tier one is $6.90 a unit. If we eliminate tier two, because um, with the recent court order, we were told not to collect tier two charges anymore. So we jump from tier one to tier three. Tier three is 2101 a unit. So our customers are seeing a jump from 690 a unit to 2101 a unit under our current and, and rates. What's the, is that how many HCF is that? It's uh, yeah. tier, three tier one is going because tier one is now is encompassing tier, tier one and tier two. It's going from zero to um, three. zero to 
seven point nine nine. And then eight units and above is at the tier two rate of twenty one oh one. Okay, so once you're above eight the difference isn't that much, but if you're in six to eight there's a big jump. Correct. So these rates is stage three or two on top of this? So this is the the base. Right, this is the base zero. rate. This is this is the base rate. So there may be some stage charges on top right. of this. Stage well, charges would this, be high. But this this includes the supply that you have right now. Yeah, so yeah, we, yeah. we don't need to add any stages on top. This collects the same amount of revenue as you're currently collecting. Yeah, so let me let me say that in a different way. So because we've been in stage three, I think for four years, maybe five, that's kind of the new norm, what our customers are used to, that rate, because we've been doing that. So we're going off that as, as being the, the base rate, if you will, and so working from that. So the rate, that 10%, uh, 8%, that's off of revenue needs, that's off the stage three rates that we're at now. So we're, uh, uh, and then the other important point to make is if the board does want to continue stage three because of the, the intimate threat of further seawater intrusion, uh, what we thought is that they could continue to do that, but they wouldn't have to charge additional, uh, the, the uh, incur those additional charges that are associated with the different stages. But we could do all the other aspects. Okay. Um, that's my question. Yeah. So <laughs> that's that's the thinking. Is that clear? It looks those semi two don't fuzzy. Have to go together. You can be in stage three without necessarily yeah, we, implementing. Stage right, three we can rates. still do the messaging saying, hey, it's still important to conserve. Here are all the, the plethora of things we have. We're not uh, uh, going to do additional uh, rates on top, or, or charges on top of that, because based on what Sanjay's presenting, it, it already covers that. But won't we still have to have in the whole rate structure listed potential stage yeah. three we rates? We will. We, we will, will have, have that. Yes. Two, eight, yes. Oh, 218, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And, and, so six HCF is about 150 gallons a day, just for reference. Mm -hmm. so but that's over um, a month. month, and then divide by 30. Yeah, so it's 150 it gallons yeah. per person per day, roughly. Yeah. Yeah. So. so I believe six units encompasses about 90. Three ninety-four percent of our customer base. If it's it's yeah, twelve is ninety-four. Okay. Um, six, I don't know on top of my head. Okay. But that's my next slide. So we've yeah. increased the fixed charge. We've changed a little bit of the tier definitions, and we've changed the tier price. So the question, of course, is what does this mean? So again, I just want to reiterate: this is the same revenues without the ten percent increase in revenues. Um, what I'm showing you here is different units. So we have two units, five, seven, nine, and 12. I'm showing you the current bill, the proposed bill, the dollar change, and the percent change. So as you can see, if you use two units, and this is for a, a 5 8 inch meter, if you use two or five units, you actually will see a reduction in your bill. Again, this is not without, this is sort of a hypothetical bill because without the 10% increase. So if we did do the 10%, it would be across the board. So you can, you know, so you'll see what the changes are. So the, f the person who uses five would actually still see a slight decrease instead of 11, a negative 12% will be negative 2% roughly. Um, then you can see the other individuals who use seven, nine, or 12 units. And as you can see, if you go above 12, you do see an increase. Now, as you know, in your current rate structure, you do have a tier four that is very high. Um, so we did want to show you usage above that, but before I go there, Oh, and there's a little animation here, um, that 94% of the bills use 12 units or less. So this is 94% of your customers are in, are, it live in this world. Is there any question about this slide before? I know this is a good slide, so if I there's I a question. With yeah. one of your other graphs, I think like 70% of the people would have either a lower bill yes, or that's a not more graph. than a $5 mm -hmm. increase. Yeah, yeah so I'm going to show that in a second. Okay. So this is the next one. This is those who use above 12. Now, it, one thing you'll notice is that once you go above 20 units, um, you actually will see a decrease. Now, there are very few people in these higher usage. Um, basically, 6% of the bills are above 12 units. Um, 
you know, it's with these individuals who are way outside, my recommendation would be given the challenges you have with your groundwater basin is that you would put penalties or something because this is just, it's not appropriate to use this. And th this wouldn't fall under Prop 218. This is not a revenue stream. This is a, you know, change your behavior. But we could do it with 218 in place, these penalties you're talking about. It, these penalties I'm talking about don't fall under Prop 218. This is a true penalty. This is like crossing, um, jaywalking, or, well, I don't think they give jaywalking tickets anymore. It doesn't seem like it. But, but it is a penalty for <laughs> what your water usage is. Correct. Yeah. So one could claim 218 applies since it's just how much water you're using. But it wouldn't be based on consumption, correct? I would turn to your attorney. Yeah. And it, you, you can enact a penalty that's anybody above a certain amount is going to pay a penalty. Uh, Santa Cruz has that in existence already. <clears throat> and it's not based, it's not under 218 because it's basically punitive. It's, it's under the, the penal code section that per, um, allows you to penalize overuse of water, wasting of water. So it's the waste, wasteful water use. All right. Okay. What we don't want to do is assume that that revenue comes in and build mm -hmm. that into our financial plan. Yeah. Right. Then that's right. a problem. Right. Then we want to hope that everyone behaves properly. Well, you could even use this penalty money for something other than the general fund. Correct. But you don't want to count on it. Yes. That's the main thing. Yes. So backing up, uh, reliability. Mm -hmm. How maybe it's more staff that came up with that estimate for reliability. How defensible and what types of decisions were made? For the the amount of mo the amount of money in water reliability. Yeah. Well, how did you determine this is reliability cost for reliability? Like Particularly since we have two reliability in, criteria. In terms of the tier threshold or in terms of the costs that roll into the that? 5 the revenue. Million, right? the revenue. Yeah, 5.7 yeah. okay. million. Yeah. 5.7 million. So the items that are considered water reliability <laughs> costs are um, those associated with, with recovering our groundwater basin. So um, I believe we did have the MGA costs in there, but we pulled those out. Too. We pulled some of it out that we are put it in tier one. Yeah, they're associated with uh, um, general costs. That's like 700,000. Okay, because I, I think we felt at this point in time we were obligated to participate in the mm -hmm. MGA regardless of, of the water use. Because but the repair, the, the impairing of the basin, is that's the cost. That's the cost. And then any, any cost to develop a supplemental supply. So all of our community water plan efforts would be towards water reliability. But we have two supplemental supply criteria here. There's with some you know, funds and well, without funds. The, what we're talking about right here, though, is simply our current budget. Right, because right now he's still comparing just this current budget to our current rate structure. He hasn't considered the okay. costs in That's the fair. future. That's but fair. The, the reliability would be more expensive without grants or whatever. I, I don't know costs. what our current structure has in it. Uh, our, our current structure has um, some of the preliminary studies and preliminary work we're doing on Pure Water Soquel. Mm -hmm. I think there are costs in there to uh, evaluate the stormwater recharge efforts. There is, I believe, 10,000 in there for the uh, draft EIR on deep water desal. Water, so trans water, water transfers. transfers um, so all of that type of stuff is, okay. is, is what's hitting that water reliability. Okay, I get it. So this is um, a histogram where we actually calculate the bill for all your customers. So we know what your current their current bill is. We know based on this rate structure what their bill would be if they use the same amount of water. Um, and then we just basically look at the change. So you can see over here about fit. And again, this is want to echo. This is without a revenue adjustment. So 50% of the bills will actually see a decrease or no change. So these decreases are uh, usually very modest. Um, some customers around, I would say, 22% will see a zero to five dollar increase, and then you have some customers who will see a, a more significant increase. And let me try to say it. Mm -hmm. uh, so Sanjay presented the revenue needs the 10%, 8% that's earlier with and without grants, 
And what you see is that the low end will st and the fixed cost, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I want to put it in perspective with potential rate increases, so it's not a surprise that if you go with anywhere in the realm of what he's suggesting up there in the previous slides, is that the low end would be, s the very low end would be slightly more, the six unit would probably be just a little bit less than what they're paying now, even with the increases, and then as you go up, it gets, they would pay more until you get to the very top end where they'd pay less. So it's not a, a linear thing, it's the lo very low end would pay just a little bit more, then the six unit type person might pay just slightly less, that I'd call that the average user, and then uh, as you go up, uh, it pays, you pay more until you get to the very top end because of that, uh, we don't have a tier three or tier four, you pay less, so. And it looks like the greater than 35 range is in the 12 to 15 segment. Correct. So. And so the story here, it, and you know, we have to be comfortable with the story, is, is that, you know, the groundwater is impaired. We have enough water for everyone if they use six or less. If you want to use more than six, you know, you, you're more welcome to, um, but then you need to pay for the costs mm -hmm. to repair the basin. And that cost is significant because we're in a challenged environment. Mm -hmm. So does that hold water, that, that story? If, we, if everybody was at six or less, would we be all right? That's based on a pre-recovery pumping goal that we've used in other literature. So that wouldn't recover the basin, but it means that we wouldn't be making it much worse. Right kind of a status quo amount. And the other thing about a two-tiered structure, um, I think it kind of gets a, well, anyway, it, it, it can be a very effective conservation structure because of, uh, it, there's, a, there's a clear delineation between tier one and tier two costs. And if you do one, two, three, four, I mean, you can argue this different ways, but some people, argue that, well, I'm in tier two, it doesn't matter if I go to tier three, it's not as clear versus what you're, what you're being proposed This is a clear either. conservation signal. Yeah, there's a clear conservation signal. Except for the upper, upper high Except range. Except for the, 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 high, the very Matt, we'll need to do a piddly on. I mean, do they really care? Some, some of well, I would like to have their money if they don't care. <laughs> yeah, they don't seem to. Mm. Yep. Yeah, so I, don't, I don't know if I agree with the, the story. Okay. I think the story is we need to recover our basin. We need to recover it faster, and it's going to take more resources if we're using more water rather than the story of if we don't, if we don't uh, use water, then we don't need to recover our basin. Well, we kind of looked at that scenario in right. a way. Yeah. You want to talk about that flat yeah. rate? Yeah, that's the uniform rate structure. So that, that's the next one I'm going to show. But before I go there, just I want to make sure um, with the current tiered rate, w there is a one challenge with this rate structure um, is that first 15% uh, of the water is used in tier two. However, um, $5.6 million is generated in that tier, um, which represents 47% of the commodity sales. So very little water, but a lot of revenue. Mm -hmm. And so there is a there is a risk there because all of a sudden there is a very strong delineation sure. between it. And if someone pays attention to their bill, I'm like, wow, hey, honey, let's be really, you know, we're spending a lot of money. This, you know, this is a very expensive. Let's try to stay under, you know, six units. Um, we could have some revenue instability. So given that, um, there's two ways to deal with that risk. There's a risk here, financial risk, and um, one is is that we could do a rate stabilization fund. So you have that money in the bank, basically, and you can draw down on that. And so we will want to build that up. Another one is, is that we can do some sensitivity analysis. Because remember, there's some people who are already paying that amount of rev water in that higher tier. It's really that, that segment, as you mentioned, um, that, yeah, so how much sales is really occurring in there, and how much of that do we expect to lose and change? So we could do that analysis mm -hmm. and look at that. But that's something I recommend and then have a discussion if we do the two-tiered rate structure, how to deal with that. Because I, I don't want to set something up and then everyone changes their behavior and then all of a sudden everyone's in tier one. So is it, 
is it one consideration that you guys thought, well, no, I guess you can't go to eight. You've got a good rationale for six. We want to have a story here, we, you know, and we have to be comfortable with the story. So that's a very important, you know, whatever we do here, I want to make sure everyone's comfortable with the story because it has to stick. I'm not going to be here, you know, I'll be gone. I'll, of course, love to come back, but, you know, you, you have to live with this story. So, and, we, and it has to be something that we can feel comfortable explaining. So if we do a uniform rate structure, that's the second option, it would be $9.52. So it'd be, everyone would pay that amount. Um, whether you're commercial, irrigation, now the meter charges will be different based on the peaking ratio, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and then this is the impact. Now the challenge with this rate structure, when we go to $9.52, is, is that the lower end users will see a, more of a dramatic increase because they won't have that low tier one rate that you currently have. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, the two units and the five units, um, they do see a, a greater increase. And then once you go above 12 units, you see actually they start seeing a decrease in the rates. Well, I'm, yeah, I'm not comfortable with this story either. <laughs> but uh, the story I'm comfortable with, so this story says it doesn't matter how much water you use, um, the basin needs to be recovered, and it doesn't matter if I use a lot of water and make it more difficult to recover the basin. The And the first story was um, if... I don't use a lot of water, um, the basin doesn't need to be recovered and we're, we're okay. So I'm somewhere in between. I do think that, that somebody uses a lot of water, puts more stress mm -hmm. on the basin and requires actions to be swifter and, and um, stronger. More and recovery. So, so that, but you still, I think a part of it had, of what we are doing with supplemental water supply is just towards recovery so i guess that argues for oh. having reliability but being careful with with not putting everything into there reserving some some actions for for recovery i mean could the story just be that you know at that 2300 level we're just trying to not make it worse we still need to recover we still need it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. Right. Yeah, and because if we if we don't make it worse, and our water levels are too low, right. we're going to have we're this. We're still at risk. Mm -hmm. We're still at yeah. risk. So Look to the next slide, because I think that that's to me says a lot about why this okay. is not the right thing. I agree. This says doesn't matter. You know, just use as much as you want, because you're not you're not impacting the recovery that needs to happen. Yeah. So I mean, if we did do uniform. Um, this is one definitely where I would recommend having penalties in place where you would say if you use a certain above, then you get a, you pay a penalty to change people's behavior. Um, but these penalties would be so egregious that uh, they're not liable to sit there and just say, okay. Yeah. The, the challenge here is, is that, um, you know, it's a chicken or egg we're in right now in the sense of what are we going to do with water reliability? And then what's the story with the rate structure and how do we, you know. Okay, yeah. That's our challenge. Yeah, and it's none of them are good. We're just trying to pick the best one. <laughs> what, and what's reasonable. And right. and to me, it, there's a story here. I know it's, it, it's that if you use six or less, you're not um, causing a problem. M and maybe there's some wordsmithing that needs to be said. Um, you're not making it worse. You're not making it worse. And if you're using six and above, you're making it worse. Yeah, so I agree with that. So, but maybe maybe it's the reliability where that I'm not agreeing with. Okay. Because it's not a reliable supply if you don't recover the basin, the water levels. Mm -hmm. It's reliable short term. You're just, you're just saying it should be, should be called like supplemental supply for recovery or something like that rather than well I, just I'm just what I'm saying is that if you've got I don't know how decisions were made and what's reliable makes it reliable but I'm I'm saying that part of that should be just the recovery and another part should be you know key I mean, that additional part could be just called recovery then. 
rather than the liability. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's that's really what it's for. That's why we want to focus. I mean. So everyone, not, but should, should, should only high, high use people who use a lot of water pay for recovery or should everyone pay for recovery? There are some water reliability costs that are being captured in tier one. The, we pulled everything out of tier two with the exception, I believe, of pure water SoCal. So the costs for the MGA are being captured in tier one. Okay. Our conservation costs are being captured in tier one. Um, so it's just a supplemental supply project that's the water reliability costs primarily in tier two. I mean, another way to think about it is if everyone was tier six or below, we wouldn't have the problem that we would need to have recovery from. Wouldn't have. We, we wouldn't have. <laughs> and we've done that. And so clearly the people that have been above the six range, they're the people that have really caused the problem. And therefore, they should really be paying to get it fixed. Now, indeed, one of the issues is that they might discover that, you know, well, we can just change our usage and get, escape that charge for recovery. But traditionally, you know, our, our uh, uh, sensitivity ratio has not been very high. Mm -hmm. We raise rates and usage doesn't go crashing down to the basement. It kind of maybe goes down a little bit, but not much. So people are pretty insensitive to rate increases. Well, in this particular um, rate impact, is going to feel very similar to what they're yes. paying for right. the next six months, so which is the 690 jumping to 20. So we should probably see very little change. Yeah, I, I'm not arguing with the the structure. I'm just arguing with the logic, mm -hmm. and I think it's very important to have sure, you know, the story bulletproof. Yeah. Yes. Logic. Yeah. So because if this was challenged, I mean, you would have to explain why these rates are there. Exactly. What it's for Correct. and what it's not for. And this is our first meeting yeah. about this, so this is a good opportunity, you know, okay. to think mm -hmm. about it. We should move on. Sorry, yeah. I've, I've made my point more than once. And mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is the impact if we do uniform, as you can see, um, some it, it would be a significant impact for certain. Co well, not significant, but the majority of the customers will see a five to fifteen dollar increase. Um, some will see a decrease, which are the high end users. You, you know, you can tell from that chart who the winners and losers are. Um, we've also examined fire, um, private fire lines. Um, we looked at the cost associated with just fire in itself. We've allocated between public and, and private. Um, we're looking at the fire sizes associated with it. Um, we've also worked with Taj and engineering to determine how much of your system, different facilities, how much of it's used for fire, um, how much is not for size for fire. So we've taken that into account. Um, this is our proposed fire line charges that we're recommending. Again, this is without the 10% increase. Quite a drop. Yeah. So next, I'm going to go to customer select. So I've warmed up your brain. This is, that was sort of the lap around the pool or uh, the first mile. Now we're going to get into the the uphill run <laughs> mentally with customer select. So I, I wanted just to do some reminder slides because it's been a while since we've talked about it and we, we did talk about these slides. So these are um, repeat slides basically um, when we talked about it, but just to remind ourselves that we did discuss about objectives. There was three major objectives, fairness, equity, defensibility, uh, um, excuse me, um, yeah, those three. Um, so fairness and equity, that means many plans tailored to individual needs. Defensibility, that would mean, for me, narrow plans again, because we want, we, we don't want to have a situation where the plan was a really large and someone's complaining, you know, I'm in a large plan, but I'm on the bottom tail of that plan and you're charging me for all this other stuff that I don't use. Um, so there's potential problems associated with that. So the outcome is many narrow plans to meet both of those objectives. I know that's controversial. We've also talked about only focusing on single family because and multifamily, excuse me, so residential because they're similar. Um, Non-residential, they have some large meters for uh, for standby capacity, such as um, Cabrillo and the Sea um, Seascape Golf Course. Um, so we're not going to do non-residential. Um, we did talk about having an open enrollment plan. 
um, where customers can change. We talked about whether that should be three to 12 months. We've done both analysis, three months, six months, and 12 months, which I'll be showing. Um, we do recommend that if you do an open enrollment that you have a roll-in period throughout your service area so that your customer service doesn't have everyone calling in, it sort of um, rolls over. Um, we did recommend that you automatically adjust to the higher plan once you go into that plan. One of the discussions we had earlier on was about penalties. So if you went outside your plan, what would, what would happen to you? Because of, um, and the challenge with Prop 218 is, is that if both people use the same amount of water, why would one be charged a penalty and another one not just because they chose the wrong plan? Um, so what uh, the rec our suggestions is, is is that we jump into the higher plans and they basically stay in that plan for potentially three to six months. Yes. But talking about 218, you could also charge that, you know, here I am, I, I did use, you know, 12 units one month, but now you're still charging me at the 12 month even though I'm using three. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, it'll go on for a whole, almost a whole year. Correct. And so I'm, be I'm, I'm not getting the same service that she's getting, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm charging, you know, so I think that's a, a, a charge that could also apply. So th with um, capacity, I'm comfortable, mm -hmm. because the concept of capacity is, is that, hey, I peaked off the system, and then you have that system, that idle capacity for me again when I show up. So I think it's fair to charge people for capacity where um, I think it does get problematic is what we call the water reliability. And I have a slide on that in here where if somebody did, because um, right now we're basically following the similar tier logic mm -hmm. that if you're in plan zero to six, you don't pay the water reliability charge. If you go above that, then you do pay the water reliability charge. If someone bumps into the water reliability charge, but then all of a sudden drops back down and they're doing the good thing, should they be charged the water reliability? in those other months. And that's, I can see that being challenging. Mm -hmm. So I, um, that's something to consider. I'm l definitely looking into getting an input from the advisory committee <coughs> from them about what they think is appropriate. There are some thoughts I have, but it, anyways, I'll, I'll like to get their input on that. Um, we are meeting with them in October. Uh, mm -hmm. Another issue that just came to me is that, you know, we're bumping people who go over up and keeping them there, mm -hmm. but we're not doing the same thing going down. If I if I'm on a, you know, a ten to twelve plan and I only use six, you're not automatically bumping me down and keeping me there for, so that's also you know. Well, so then we're getting into a tiered rate structure. I mean that's what it. Yeah. That's yeah, that's what a tiered rate structure is. Is where mm -hmm. those you you if you peak or if you use a lot more water in the summer or whatever you only pay it for once. This one, basically, if you peak or use a lot more water, you, you're paying for that mm -hmm. for a longer period. The capacity concept. The capacity, yes. Um, let me make sure I covered, sorry, I covered this one. So the next one is credit. Um, we talked about that should there be a credit available, and we said yes, there should be a credit available at the end of the year. One of the things we're thinking about, the cost of groundwater production, at the time, now with this information and doing the analysis, there might be some other things we may want to consider as credit um, as we look at this. Um, variance and consideration. So of course we want to have appeal process um, and variance in place if we do this. Um, you know, customers who do not um, select would be based on the actual usage that occur. Um, and then we automatically adjust based on use. Um, and based on input from the board, we were recommending that we use, um, based on input, we will use 50 gallons to units of two. I'm worried about the, uh, the first section there. Um, the variances appeal like mm -hmm. medical devices and scat. That's what gets us into the 218 again, that you know someone is, may have a real problem, but they may not even have much income, and there's all kinds of rationales for why one person might w not want to pay as much as some other person, even yeah. though they're using the same amount of water, and that gets you into 218 problems. So you don't have to have it. Okay. I mean, this is, was um, based on input that we heard, so. Okay, well, all right. Yeah, so it's up to you. These are policies. Mm -hmm. So now the valuation. So what we've done is, is we've looked at three months, six months, and 12 months. 
So we actually looked at consumption that occurred and we looked at, and if somebody peaked a lot, they are stuck with that peak for 12 months. If they peaked a little, or if they peak a lot, they're, they're stuck with this six months and then three months. Now, the interesting things about this rate structure is just the number of units. So as you have um, larger, if you have 12 units, 12 units um, um, have more, oh, let me see what the slide says. Three units have fewer units than six units, and six units have fewer units than 12 units because you don't get stuck in the higher plan. So it's the, as Leslie said, it's the flexibility. So the 12 units has less flexibility. 12 months, you mean. 12 months, excuse me, sorry. 12 months has uh, less um, flexibility. <laughs> Sorry about that. 12 <laughs> months has less flexibility um, and has more units in the higher tiers, in the higher plans. Um, one of the challenges with this rate structure, though, is if we did do this, is how do we roll it out? And is it appropriate to look at past behavior and charge based on that? Or do we start brand new and just look at this month and then roll it out? from this month? Or do we look at the prior three months, six months, or 12 months? And it matters because if we use the last um, three months, six months, 12 months, then um, the plan rates will be similar each year. If we roll it out the first month, depending on the month that we choose, it could have different quantities. And the rates could actually jump up. The rates would. Um, would be higher in the first year and then could potentially drop in the second year. So there's some phasing issues associated with this and how we phase this out that we need to think through if we do this. So that's a, another wrinkle to think about. Um, so this is, um, as we talked about, um, um, Director Daniels, you mentioned this about the higher plans. And if you got into higher plans, is it appropriate for that person to pay for those additional costs? And for me, the, one of the challenges is the water reliability. So if somebody uses, um, stays, they want to use the four unit plan, but then one month they jump into the seven unit month plan and they get stuck, but they went back to four units in the actual use, is it appropriate for them to pay <coughs> the water reliability? Because they just jumped one month and be stuck with that, let's say if it was a 12 month period. So that's something to think about. Um, and then oh, what about um, water supply and delivery? So these are concepts that we need to, you know, work through and figure out if we, um, we did this. So what are the rates? We actually modeled it. We developed similar to the tiered rate structure. We follow the same logic as the cost of service. Now what we have is we have customer service, which we do have in the tiered rate structure. We have peaking, but now the peaking is not on the meter charge, it's on the plans. So we've allocated on the plans instead of the meter charge. We have supply costs, we have delivery costs, and we have the water reliability, which is similar to the tier, except in this one, it's, a, it's, it, it's in the six unit plan or higher. So um, we actually calculated the peaking by plans. So we actually looked at how much people peaked within the plans between summer and winter. Um, and that's what this shows you here. We didn't, we're not showing you all the plans, but we actually did calculate that. And so those people who, for instance, if you think about it, if you use three to four units, <laughs> That person's most likely going to use, there's not much peaking there. <laughs> They're staying in three or four units. But if you use um, above um, like 11 to 12 units, those people peak. They use 12 units and then they go back down. And so there's some capacity there that they use in the summer that they don't pay for the winter. So we want to charge them for that. So there's a lot of information here, but this is sort of the story behind it. So the first column is the customer service. This is just the cost to meet or read, have someone available to answer the phone. So every plan pays $4.40. And this is it's similar to the, um, the tiered rate structure. We've also calculated something similar like that. The second component is the peaking charge. So if you recall, in the tiered rates, the peaking component's on the meter charge. Here, it's on the plans. So bigger your plan is, more you use. In the tiered rate structure, it's on the meter size. So someone could have a 5 8 inch meter, but they don't use that much water, but they still are paying for all that capacity, all that peak. In this one now, they're paying it based on how much actual water they use. So we shift that cost over to plans. 
Next is the water supply costs, um, which is similar to the tiered rate structure, again, in units of two. We have the base, again, that's linear. And then we have the water reliability. And the water reliability, as you notice, only shows up once you go above six units. And that's, again, uh, it's a unit charge. So you add all those up together, you get the plan. Now, one thing you'll notice is that if you don't use any water throughout the whole year, you only pay $4.40. Um, not that many people use um, no water throughout the whole year. I mean, there maybe a, we do have a couple. But if you use um, very little water, then you see that the charge is much less. And then if you use a lot of water, you get charged more. And then, of course, remember, this is a 12-month plan. So if in one month, if I jump into a higher use, I get stuck with that higher charge for the whole year. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to mention that when this was presented to the rate committee, um, the public members on there, I kind of sat there and listened, but the public members went totally berserk about this. But the level zero usage in the other plan, the tiered, inclining tiered ratio, was what, $41 or something? I forget what it was. What's the base zero charge? For uh, 36. 36? Yeah. Okay. 36, whereas this, is four dollars and forty cents and it was mentioned and that may be true that at four dollars and forty cents you probably would barely pay for going out reading the meter preparing the bill sending the bill taking care of getting back four dollars and forty cents and putting it in the bank and, um, so it's not to mention having fire service available right. and reliability you know. and, and even just the depreciation on our system I mean you know Pipes eventually break and they have to get replaced, and wells eventually, and four dollars and forty cents. I mean, if everyone is at that level, the, the system would just not work at all. So or even meter maintenance. I'm not sure we're capturing the cost to even right. maintain a meter at that residence, and that would happen whether they used water or not. Yeah, so we could look at different scenarios here. One is put meter maintenance as a cost component. But the idea here is that we're trying to get away from the meter into plans well yeah. you could take the previous numbers you had mm -hmm. and use them s here instead of these these are different numbers than the previous set yeah the the, the previous ones um, assume basically plan switching monthly this is assumed do the same thing you could still lock people into plans yeah but the, I have to count the number of units because the units there's more people in the higher tiers right the, in the tiered rate structure, right. you, you fluctuate, right? You move up and down. Mm -hmm. And this one, you don't. This one, you're stuck. For some amount of time. You some yes. amount of time, yes. Right. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, so this one now shows basically the three options of a 12 months, six months, and three months. We also show that the proposed tiered rates as a reference point. Um, I'm also showing you the bill counts associated with it because the bill counts are going to be different because in the 12 month plan, as you notice, there's a lot more people in the higher tiers or in the higher plans, excuse me. Um, like for instance, if you look at the 10 units, right, let's just look at 10. So in the tiered rate, there's only 7.4% of the bills use 10. While when the 12 month plan, there's 10.8 people get stuck there so all of a sudden I use it once I'm stuck there now so I'm paying for that for a longer period of time um, if you go to the six month plan then it goes to um, 9.8 and then the three month plan is similar it's getting similar to the one month plan or the tiered rate structure So the next slide is basically showing that compared to the uniform rate structure. Um, it, um, I don't think there's much interest in the uniform rate structure based on the input I got earlier on from the board. So I'm not going to cover that. Is there any questions or comments about customer select um, associated with it? I'm skeptical. One of the things that I find is it's very complicated mm -hmm. of all this. You know, getting stuck in things, uh, the, the issue about how you have the things start off. Um, the uh, Anyway, I, I, I don't see how we explain this system to our customers. It's, it's a lot more complicated than, you know, our current inclining 
system. That's fairly simple to know. And this isn't. You know, maybe it's worth um, sharing uh, at least what I think it was the sentiment of the uh, Water Rates Advisory Committee at the last meeting, which was like about a week or two ago. And Leslie, Sanjay, board members who are on that, correct me if you're wrong, but what I heard, and these are people, these are public members that have dedicated, you know, a year, over a year of their uh, service, you know, about on a monthly basis. and coming in and really liking this method so they they were invested in it but at the last meeting what I thought I heard and correct me if I'm wrong was they think it's worth continuing to evolve it maybe Sanjay presents it at a, a aqua meeting or two and let people you know put their input to it maybe when we get uh, if and when and if we get uh, AMI because then people will know their usage and would know if they're creeping up you know they could get a, um, a, a a message sent to them on a hourly basis I guess if they wanted or whatever but um, that it's time may not quite be there and I thought that was telling for me for people who put so much effort into this and, and were really beholden to it at the beginning but going through this process I think I think that's where they kind of ended up is that a, is that a fair assessment would you say that the last meeting I wasn't there you weren't Sorry. there that's right but Leslie and I think director Daniels was I was yeah, was that, is that a fair characterization of what we thought we heard? They would like to see a, a, an effective customer select scheme. Uh -huh. They just don't think this is it. Uh -huh. Maybe it's not ready. It needs, it's needs more yeah. work. Well, yeah. also, there's the issue that our system won't be prepared to implement right. this right. probably for another year. So adopting this now means that we couldn't actually do it because we don't have our system ready for it. So we have to hold off at least a year and I think we all we really should spend more time thinking about how we can simplify it so that we can actually get customers to understand mm -hmm. what they're being charged and and understand it is required if you're going to understand how it's fair because if it's just random bills coming with all kinds of numbers and <coughs> charges and it it means that people just assume it's not fair So I'm going to move on, unless yes. we need to talk. Okay, so we're moving on. So the next topic is emergency rates. Um, there are different approaches of collecting emergency rates. So this is not just, we talked about drought penal, uh, penalty rates. Penalties don't fall on Prop 218. We're trying to change behavior. It's not a revenue stream. This is a revenue stream. This would need to fall under Prop 218. It would be in our administrative record. It would be in your Prop 218 notice. You would uh, adopt it. Um, you would have triggers associated with it. Um, you don't have to implement it. It's sort of your back pocket policy. And you could always implement something less than what's adopted across the board. So if it, if it just creates flexibility. And as you know, droughts occur. And when they do occur, unfortunately, in um, 2014 for you, it happened very quickly. So it, these things can happen very fast. So you want to have that in your back pocket. There are three approaches. One is a fixed meter charge, where basically as the meters get bigger, you pay more. That's what Santa Cruz has, and they have different stages. You can have a uniform, where it's a HCF, um, or you can have a tiered, which is what you had in the past. Um, based on our discussion with staff, our recommendation is to update the emergency rates using your tiered or commodity approach, um, similar to what you've done in the past. This is a good opportunity. Um, if the board has other things they would like to evaluate, we could do that. Um, as you know, we have a lot on our plate <laughs> already, so, but we could um, evaluate if, there, if there's an interest. Tiered commodity sounds like the way to go okay. for emergency for me. So it's also that. real simple. You just say your, whatever your bill is, it's increased by 3%. Exactly. Um, so next step is to receive direction from the board on which rate um, structure to proceed for further refinements, um, then to show the proposed five-year rates with the increase and the proposed rates, and to develop their five-year emergency rates too. Because once we know what the proposed rate structure is, then I can develop the emergency rates. I mean, I'm 
we need to hear from the public, but I just, I'm, I'm pretty strongly leaning towards just the two tier approach. Um, and I think I like Dr. Daniel's idea of maybe seeing about an alternative to jumping it up high at first and maybe smoothing that out. You know, whether it was oh, nine, okay. nine, nine versus two or three. Mm -hmm. Let's get public comment yeah. first before we start discussing it, okay. which we've already been doing. Um, so anyone wish to address us on this item? Thank you, uh, Becky Steinbrenner. I came in late and I apologize. Um, but I was at the uh, rate committee hearing uh, meeting and I, I heard the great uh, outcry from the public members on that when they saw this presentation. So I'm glad you're moving slowly on it. Um, I had, I, I just want to point out that it looks to me like uh, this is sort of fueling um, the funds to help pay for Pure Water SoCal. Please confirm, is, is this uh, taking into account the cost, because I see contingencies with grants, without grants, is this building the cushion to pay for Pure Water SoCal? Yes and no, I'd say. Pure Water SoCal is in the five-year finance plan. Okay. So that's part of why these rates are being built um, in the way that they are now. And I want to point out that still your board claims, at least I think, that you haven't made up your mind you're going to choose. There's also money something. in the budget for water transfers. Yes, this is a rate study. This is a revenue study. Yeah, but there's also water in there for water transfers, the program we're doing now and for looking at deep water desal, which we're doing now. So all of that is built into this? If you had to buy water from deep water desal, that's also built into this? I'd suggest taking comment and then, mm -hmm. yeah. then responding. Yeah. All right, I understand, no back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, all right, thank you for that bit of clarification. Um, I just want to point out regarding Pure Water SoCal that your own documents show in um, <coughs> that ha adding that project to your system would increase the supplemental supply operating costs beginning fiscal year 2023-2024 to an estimated, by an estimated, almost two and a half million dollars. Two and a half million dollars. And uh, already the groundwater management for 2018 2019 is at five million dollars additional so i think there are some readily available things and i'm really looking forward to uh, the day this november hopefully when the water comes from um, santa cruz city the north coast streams and that's going to help a lot i want to also ask a question and i've only got a bit of time here what what is exactly meant by emergency rates? What is, what do you define as emergency rates? Is that when you have to buy water or sell water to other agencies or, or if you could please define emergency rates and what the criteria for declaring emergency rate status would be, I'd appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will, I will just say that explanation is pretty uh, explained in our urban water management plan. And then if you have questions from staff, Beyond that, the I just want to remind the board that there was the gap rate. Uh, if no supply is um, pursued, that that was another evaluation that was presented last time, uh, and the rates are also being looked at the revenue, whether uh, the fifty million dollar grant or some portion that's provided or not. So I just want to make sure that's clear. Yeah. Anyone else wish to address us? No I one. just have one comment. When you start throwing around the numbers, they sound really big. If you look at the effect on the individual bills, it's not as big as you think. The other, the other, well, I have two comments. The other comment is, what is the cost of having seawater come into our aquifer? That's something that that we have to to weigh the costs of any supply of water transfers or pure water SoCal or deep deep water desal 
or any supplemental supply. It's it's not a it's not something you can just say we don't want to pay this. You have to also say at the same time we're willing to risk the aquifer and the the amount of money it would cost if it were to to be intruded by seawater. So. Okay, let's bring it back to the board and discuss uh, these next steps. So we have to pick a uh, right. rate structure. For me, it's pretty clear. I already said. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to express well, their opinion? Th I, I was thinking about uh, Director Hornschmeyer um, and how he said we should have a rate structure that's a continuous curve. And the actually the uh, cus customer select is kind of like that because it's got so many different possibilities you know it's broken down so finely um, I don't know whether we can pull off customer select I, I, I like that it it uh, instead of saying you have a meter of a certain size so that determines how much your impact is on the system and on the resource that it, it's it's tied to how much water you use, but I I do think it would before I would support it I'd want to at very least have um, groups of of our customers really you know get together and and say we're willing to do this we're not willing to do this and have to look at what the education part of it all is. You know, I'd be doing something so different than what everybody else is doing. There's a cost involved there with, with, with education. So I'd like to see it happen at some point, and maybe it's when or if AMI occurs where there's that feedback. But I don't think that we should pursue it any farther than what we have. But I would like to see it keep coming back to the board as an option. Um, relative to that, I, I think one of the things that was discussed is that at some point when we get this owned so we're reasonably comfortable with it, we could even put this on people's bills and say, if these rates were applied, this is what you'd be charged. So give people an experience of it. It could be a subset of the customers or something. And uh, so you could see if this new thing were to be implemented, this is what the effect would be on me. Because, yeah, it's kind of arbitrary now. You can see all these charts and graphs and tables and things, and knowing how it affects individual customers, not quite clear. I actually thought it was kind of interesting. I was looking at the that slide that shows what the cost would be for the tiered, right, and then for those different usage, what it would be for customer select, and actually... Um, if you're a low water user, you're going to get a benefit out of it, even if you do get pushed up to the next tier for three months or 12 months. It's just it's it's um, hard to understand how it affects you. I mean, when you talk about somebody going up to the next tier and being stuck there for six months, but when the tiers, you know, instead of four dollars a month, it's 13 or instead of 62 it's 89 and then you look at the prefer the uniform rates but that's the tiered rates that's the uniform you, you want to show okay that? oh sorry no that that was one okay yeah, okay the tiered rates you can see that still you'd be paying less if you're a lower water user like 6 units at customer select and if you got bumped up to the next tier you'd be paying about what you would have been paying with the tiered rates it's it may not be as scary as we all think I mean I was a little scared by it but you know it would be better if we had AMI and then it could be connected with that and people can see what they're doing and they'll feel like they have some control being one that likes to feel like I have control, <laughs> <laughs> I would like that. <laughs> so, I mean, I 
I think for now the tiered rates would be what I would be interested in, but I'm not completely against the customer select. It's it's not really as scary as I thought it was. Um, I had a question. So you know, we, I know it was a lot of thought went into going to the forty percent fixed charges versus thirty five, and um, but then it. As you mentioned, it also creates, while that creates some financial stability, um, it also creates some potential instability in the fact that if there's that much of a jump, you might have a decrease in usage at that level, mm -hmm. which is great for the aquifer, so that may be the way to go, but just, you know, I'm still not sure about that percent change. It didn't it. change it that much. We looked at that. It okay. was, I think it was about $2 a month difference. On okay, that would, okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's and, not. and remember, if you increase the um, or decrease the fixed charge, the t the jump between tier one and two will stay the same. You're just increasing both because it's just the supply and uh, delivery charge will go up. So mm -hmm. if um, if oh, so, the, okay. So the difference would still remain yeah. for the most part. Might yeah. be slightly less, I mean, but yeah. not much. Yeah. Okay. Well, and when you're looking at 35, um, 65, I have to do my math. <laughs> um, I mean, really, it should be 60-40 yeah. if you look at what the actual costs are. The fixed costs are 90% of our costs, right. but... Um, it should be 90-10. Yeah, it should be 90-10, but I mean, <laughs> there's a point where you, you do want to still have conservation. But right. Yeah, I don't have a problem with that ex increasing it. How many things are we deciding on? We're just giving guidance. Giving direction. <laughs> right. So I think which rate structure? I think nobody likes the uniform, which I'm one of. Um, that just sends the wrong message. Right. And and the the two tiers, what we can do. Um, we obviously liked more tiers, but that wasn't doable. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of we're not quite ready for customer select, even though it's a cool idea. So to me, it seems like we're just not much choice. I actually think customer select is the most fair, if, you know, depending on your definition of fair, of course. But one, remember one feature about the customer select is you have to be involved with your rates because if you get bumped up and you never bother to go look at it again, you'll stay up there forever. So you may normally be using four units, but you've been bumped up to eight, and you'll stay at eight until you figure it out and figure out how to go to the the staff and ask them to put it back down. Um, so it, it makes people have to be involved with their rates. Whereas now all they do is just. Yeah, I don't think it's going to happen. Even if it makes them, I think what's going to happen is people will get involved and go, get, get very angry. Oh yeah. Yeah. And you have to, if, I think you have to have It'd be a tremendous education program that would have to, to be rolled out to get people to think differently. In fact, I was thinking that rather than having this, I have to go and ask the staff to put me back down after the 12 months is over. Instead, it would automatically go back down to the average of your last 12 months. Mm -hmm. So if you, got, if you went up one month in the summer and you got stuck there for 12 months, you'd take the average of all those months and you'd automatically get put down to that. And that would be less effort on the staff's part because for most folks that would be okay. Um, you know, it, if they wanted to, they could put themselves down at the zero rate if they wanted, but they'd immediately pop back up. But you know, that's, that's but you'd, you'd have to explain to people what's going to happen, and if there'd have to be some right. some way of them knowing that it's happening. Because yeah. they're not used to it now. Yeah. Because they get paid on just what they do that month. And the next month they start all over again. Sure. And I, I think we'd have to have some higher rate for the lower users to cover more of the cost, especially if yeah. it just didn't seem not fair. It doesn't seem fair mm -hmm. yeah, that structure. But summer properties or visitor whatever. Second homes. It almost seems like they're subsidized the the other normal users are subsidizing and larger families are subsidizing the low users to an extreme degree. 
So I think we've decided then we would like the yep. uh, two-tier inclining structure to be brought back with us with the mm -hmm. um, the details. The details, right? Okay. The actual revenue we need, and we'll continue to study the the customer select program uh, with some changes and. Well, I like the idea of taking it to meetings and throwing it out there and kind of it's wild and crazy. have people shoot bullets at it and then see what, yeah. what's left. Yep. You know? right. We need to know any more? No, we're good. Do you have any thank you, Sanjay. Thank, thank, thank you for your time. Thank you, Sanjay. It's nothing like a quick presentation. Yep. Okay, now we go to item 6.3. Ad revisions to the district's lake adjustment policy. <coughs> so there we go. $330,000, huh? We're giving staff directions. Mm -hmm. So after the August 21st board meeting, the um, uh, directors requested that we take a look at our leak adjustment policy. We had a variance request at that board meeting um, from an individual who had experienced some high usage while she was not in residence. And so the board had requested that we bring our leak adjustment policy back. So um, we were able to go out and we did a little analysis. And back in 2015, when we last looked at our leak adjustment policy, we actually made it more generous at that time and we revised our tier adjustment policy, rolled it into the leak adjustment policy, so people were getting um, adjustments for almost any leak um, once every three years. There was a meeting where we actually, um, the board granted a variance where a customer had uh, two, two different leaks in within a uh, fairly, uh, within that three year period, they had two different leaks and the, and the board went ahead and allowed a variance for um, giving them the, mo the more generous of the two leaks. And so over the years, these changes to our leak adjustments policy have impacted us financially. Um, it has been a significant increase in the number of leak adjustments that we're processing and the amount of the leak adjustments that we're writing off. So we wanted to be able to give you that analysis we also went out and looked at other area um, water districts here in the county to see what they were doing in terms of leak adjustments, and I've provided you that analysis. Other than Scotts Valley Water District, I don't know of any other that's giving an adjustment for simply unexplained water use. Um, there were two agencies that I could find in the state that did allow uh, an adjustment for unexplained water use, but they put some fairly restrictive limitations on it. Um, in order to kind of mitigate the, the write-off that would incur if, if they were to grant those policies. It's awfully difficult for us in our position to identify um, whether unexplained high use is simply um, a, an unintended consequence of somebody being out of town and a toilet left running or something like, like that, or if it's an instance of actual neglect or abuse. We have, we have no idea. So, I mean, is there is a reason why it couldn't just be the, like a uniform charge instead of the tiered thing on the on the am amount of an adjustment? Um, I mean, we went up because that's one thing that made it kind of um, somewhat yeah. seemed like a little bit out of punitive. Um, well, but the case we're talking about wasn't the leak. I know. D different idea. I'm just okay. saying in general. Um, th using the the tier rate sometimes makes it instead of just charging for the cost of the water. No, I, I, I agree yeah. with you. It should be the cost of the water. Because the amount issued for leak adjustments doesn't mean that that's the cost of the water that we didn't get paid for. That's what we could have gotten if we didn't adjust it right. So depending on how generous we go, um, I was able to identify that if we just expanded the scope to instances of unexplained water use and granted them the same type of leak adjustment that we currently offer, that the impact, I believe, would be about $66,000. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, if we go a more generous adjustment than that, then there's a good chance that that could be much more um, of a fiscal impact. 
for every $250,000 in write-offs, we'll have to increase rates for all of our customers 1%. How does that work if it's money that's due to the, the tiers going? Well, because when we calculate our rates, we do it based on revenue need. Mm -hmm. So we take that anticipated usage, we identify the revenue need associated with it, so and you then we calculate people using more water than they meant to. Well, it's based on historical usage, so that does include some leaks. Um, when when we when we adjust a leak, we don't adjust the consumption; we just adjust the bill. Because if we adjust the consumption, then we don't get accurate water use numbers for our state reporting. So when we pull that information for a rate study. It includes water used across the board, and that includes water attributed to leaks. So that is the basis for calculating our rates. So after that analysis, did you have a suggestion or a recommendation? I, I didn't. What I do have are a list of questions yeah, that, I that. that I would need the board to provide me input on in order for me to go back and devise a revised leak adjustment policy. Why don't we try and address them? Pardon me? We'll try to address them. Okay. <laughs> I'm still not convinced that it's a real loss of revenue, that it, it's a, a loss of revenue based on the tiers, and some of them seem kind of punitive for accidental use. But remember, like, Sanjay has pulled the last three years of consumption in order to calculate you what, have to do that. what those rates need to be going forward, and that three years of consumption includes water loss to leaks. So anyone who wishes to address us on this complicated issue, this would be the time. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. I have um, a question. How do you verify that um, a high meter reading is due indeed to an actual leak? Do you find the wet soil or the problem with the appliance or whatever? Because I have also heard your board discuss that you've had a very high failure rate on your meters. Is this a function of the problem with the meters and maybe the absentee property owners just don't know and so they get a high meter reading and assume that it's a leak? How do you verify that it is indeed a leak in the system? Thank you. Uh, I don't think we have a high No, meter that's, that's, no. that's incorrect. That's not correct. Incorrect statement. What, what it, what no, no back and forth. What, what is our failure rate for the meters? It's it's within the standards. It's it's very low because we have almost all new meters. Gotcha. You know, and then, new. if if a customer were to question whether or not there was a meter problem, they could get the meter tested, right? Right. I think what's being referred to is the battery charge going down, but the meter itself and the way it records is not inaccurate. Okay. And if it were a meter malfunction, we, we, we wouldn't see that water use increase and then decrease, and then decrease right. after, after gotcha. a repair has been okay. effected. Anyone else wish to address us? Seeing no one, back to the board. Shall we try and... Uh, Go sure. with each question? Yep. Yeah, yeah I, I just had a few questions about the, the policies of other... Sure. Agencies. Sure, let's go over so that first. That's on page 100, mm -hmm. 129. So, City of Santa Cruz, the type of leak, underground leak, or extraordinary non recurring pub plumbing issue. I don't know what that means. So, uh, what's an extraordinary non recurring plumbing issue? So, their underground leak is just for a service line leak, but if you had an uh, extraordinary, like a toilet leak, or an irrigation system leak, or that type of scenario, they do it upon proof of repair. So once, once you can prove that whatever that non-recurring extraordinary incident was has been repaired and is not likely to recur, then they will grant you a leak adjustment. Okay. 
and then the amount adjusted by Santa Cruz is all consumption in excess of prior year. So what they do is, for instance, uh, if you have your leak in August, they take last August's consumption and we, they compare that and they take, if you used 10 units last August and this year you used 20 units, they take it back and bill you for 10 units. Whereas we do a 50% reduction. 50% reduction plus we drop them to the lowest tier that they achieved the prior year. So if it was a 20 unit leak and last year they used 10 units, we would write off five units right off the bat and then we'd take those other five units and drop it down to tier two, tier three, where they hit at 10 units last year. Okay. And so City of Watsonville is unintended water use in the table for type of leak? That's, that's any unintended water use upon proof that the incident has been repaired. So again, you have to show it's repaired. Right. Okay. That's all I had. Okay. So we go back to the questions. Mm -hmm. How often should a customer receive an adjustment for unexplained water use? That's not a leak. That's just right. Like right now, we offer a leak adjustment once in a three-year period. So I don't know if you want unintended or unexplained water use to be that once every three years, or if you want to apply a different metric to it. Well, there's even the question, do we even want the unexplained water use to be adjusted? <coughs> We've never done that in the past, so I think that's the first question. Right. Do we just want documented leaks? Yeah. Well, then, you know, when, we, when a person gets blindsided by a lot of water use, it's not unreasonable for them to come to us and go, you know, what happened? And do we just say tough or do we give them, and, you know, it ha the meter's working, it happened, end of story, or do, do we listen to them or have a policy that says you know, sometimes something happens? and that it doesn't have, you know, this is not something that's recurring all the time with you and give some type of allowance for that. I favor giving some type of allowance. Yeah, I mean that, you know, the, the person that was here last time was yeah. one of those people and you, you definitely feel for them, you know, so. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like it, unless something drastically changes that could increase, you know, leak adjustments 20% and the cost go up 66,000, but maybe that's worth it if we think that's fair. I don't know. I have quite a bit of empathy for somebody that gets blindsided by, especially if they haven't even been home, mm -hmm. a huge. Unexplained use. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, but and I think, uh, I mean, whatever years interval we pick should be the same for that as anything else you know i think they range from one per year to one every five years and we're kind of in the middle range so we pick the same range we have now for leaks okay i think that's reasonable yeah, All right. I yeah. Agree. how many building periods should be adjusted per incident i didn't even understand that question so if it goes over from one billing to the next like somebody has so right now, right now, if it crosses two billing periods, we, al we adjust two different billing periods. Um, so if, if they have a leak in toward the end of July and it rolls into their August bill, then we ad adjust both their July and their August bill. I mean, Some agencies will only do one billing period. I say we, we stick do with two. That. Yeah, I, I don't know of anyone who does with, more than two. With yeah. one or two. I'm okay with the way we do it now. Oh yeah, I think you know if it starts the day before the end of a billing period and that's just goes bad luck. One, yeah, yeah. So two. I mean, hopefully with AMI we'll catch these a lot sooner. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, sometimes with unexplained high use, you can see it go on for a number of months. Well, we should be uh, even if we alert them to that. If they can't identify what's causing it. Hmm. I think if we do it 
at the two month one. And and maybe it goes three, four, five months, then the, the others won't get covered. Limited first, to two. The first two months. Yeah. Does that cover somebody that's just on the cusp? You know, just yeah. unlucky as far as their meter reading date. Mm -hmm. As long as we're informing them, if we're not. I'm sure, we are. Sure. Yeah. Are we informing them? We, if if we're out when we read the meter and we see that meter spinning at a rate that is indicative of a leak, we will notify them with a door hanger. Otherwise, they are notified when they get their bill and their bill is higher than normal. And what if they don't look at their bill? We, we don't, we don't know <laughs> when we're, we don't know whether that use is attributed to just having more people in the house or if they've put in a lawn or a garden or a pool. A pool. We, ha we, we don't know. You're right, we don't. So there's even the question of a definition of unexplained water use. To the customer, they might think this isn't unexplained. How do we know when we're just seeing the, the levels go up and down every day? And well, I, I thought we're talking about a leak now, not unexplained. No, well, no, we're uh, talking about unexplained. Unexplained means there's no explanation for the use. So all these questions are unexplained. Right. Right. We, ha we have a leak adjustment policy in place. I don't know if we want to change our current leak adjustment gotcha. policy or not. We will be reevaluating it again with a new rate structure. Right. So, so what are we doing about billing that? periods two, two, two max? Right. Okay. How should the adjustment, adjustment be calculated? calculated? So, what kind of formula do we use right. to adjust? Right. Do we want to stay with our current formula? Do we want to change that formula? Do we want a different formula for unexplained high use? So it's fifty percent <coughs> plus. The low reduce it to the low to the tier that they achieved last year. So if they're normally a tier two user, we take the other fifty percent and drop it down to tier two instead of tier four. Versus Seems the I still was wondering about the uniform rate for the excess over their normal usage. So right. And what would that be? Well, whatever the commercial rate. Whatever is. the commercial, or in this case, yeah, whatever the commercial rate would be. I don't know. How would that compare? So, so if they, uh, so you're talking about a, uh, anything over their normal usage would be billed at the commercial rate, mm -hmm. which is higher than both tier one and tier two. It's just the cost of excess water use. I don't know. So if if they're normally a tier one user and they had a leak that put them into tier two or tier three, we would charge all of that excess use. It may, it, what I'm saying is it may not be it may a be cost effective it. It adjustment. They may be charged more than, than they otherwise would have. Okay. I was thinking the other ended up usually being more because it was at their marginal rate. Difference yeah. between small leaks and big leaks. It's, and we try and encourage people because it is an adjustment that's only offered once every three years to kind of hold on to it in, in the event they have a large leak, but some customers will take it on a very small increase in their bill. So we'll only, if at most, we'll have, we'll, we'll potentially have two tiers uh, soon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that would be, I mean, if it's, if they just marginally go over that. So I don't, I don't know if you want to leave it the way it is until we adopt a new rate structure. Well, I agree that whatever we do for a leak, we should do the same thing for unexplained. Exactly. Yeah. So till we revisit the leak mm -hmm. what we're doing with the leak we should i think just adopt the same yeah I, I guess i'd have to see the difference in examples for cost to make that decision i agree it's probably should be the whole leak policy once we have new rates if we're just dealing with unexplained water use right now it should be the same as what we're doing because i don't understand the full ramifications of the uniform rate versus tiered rate with the new system Well, one, one theory here is we want to recover our costs. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. That's why I was thinking of the formula. But, you know, what costs are part of this? So clearly the pumping cost and the chlorine cost, the treatment costs, are part of our costs. But a lot of the stuff, you know, is, is not part of the usage. So That's true. But yet you don't want it to just be, I mean, I think it's like 50 cents or something is our... Right, right. It's the 10%. The cost. Yeah. Mm -hmm or 5%, so that wouldn't be not much at all. So once again, 
you want it to be high enough to discourage you know people from just ignoring leaks well yeah I don't think people are that uh, sinister I, I yeah and I would just say right now we just have to do it the way we're currently doing it and then maybe bring it back I'd be comfortable with that is just for clarification are you saying that for unintended use you use the same system as you're using now right. yes which is different because you're not doing anything for unintended use right now right, right? well no no we're by the same the same, the same, the same, same method because we're talking about calculations so the right. same for method leaks. of calculation <laughs> for leaks. that we're doing for leaks yeah. yes are there any limitations on the amount of the adjustment yeah so somebody had a max of 500 500 We don't have a max on the our current. No. So I'd stay leave it the same. Yeah. Right now. So Ron raises a good point. Most of the time there is an explanation. It takes a little sleuthing to find out what that might be. Yeah. If they have an explanation for that high use, um, like they left a hose on and it burst or they were out of town and their house sitter had a pool party, um, does that still qualify for an adjustment? For the scenario, yeah, the, the, the scenario I was thinking of so is somebody's w doing the garden hose and they leave it on and it ha doesn't have a hose bib or they're filling a hot tub and they walk away and, you know, it's so it's accidental, it's not intentional, but it's um, not unexplained either. I think we're dealing with unexplained. In most instances, people will refrain from giving an explanation <laughs> in order to get the adjustment. Because yeah. we'll be hit with these. That's why I'm trying to flush them out. Actually, these scenarios are exactly, exactly. scenarios yeah. that we've encountered so in the past. What do you What do you recommend? Well, I, I, you know, it's a balance between trying. You know, you don't want to push people to not disclose information um, uh, because they could be, I don't know, penalized is the right word, but not recoup that, that, that leak adjustment break uh, or lease adjustment, le leak adjustment funding. Um, so I, it's just one of those gray zones I just want, I would like, I think it's worth clarification because as soon as we get out of here and set the policy, I, I can almost guarantee we're gonna see it. We're gonna go, ah. It'd be an amnesty program for <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm overuse. Yeah, I, mean, I, I don't think any of that, those scenarios are intentional, and so it, it goes to the root of what you're um, doing, you're deciding on. See, so it's unintentional but explained. Yeah, I mean, you have we have those. I'm, I'm afraid to go on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> we do because encourage people to turn off their house valve. When they go There's on people that still live in the house while I'm gone. <laughs> there you go. Well, that's explained then. <laughs> so, any limitations? I would say if we have a max, a, a ceiling, you know, if we, if we want goes up this high, then, you know, then we don't deal with it differently. Then we should have a floor as well. Because we don't want to have someone coming in and saying, you know, I have this, I had, you know, 12 gallons that I, I leaked, and so I want to. Yeah, or I had company for a month. And yes, right. I don't see any need to have a limitation. Okay. So, I mean, I think if we're getting our costs back. See what you're saying. One time. I agree. I don't understand the when how far back should the adjustments from clean water use become effective? Like how quickly do are we going back? Are we going back to July first? Are we going back to the beginning of the fiscal year? Uh, the, the individual who brought the incident in August, do we want to go back far enough to accommodate her her situation? We gave my her my recommendation would not to be go to go back prior to July first because then I've got fiscal year end disclosure. 
Let's go with your recommendation then. Yes. So July 1st. Yeah, July 1st. Sounds good. Are any changes recommended to the adjustments for service line irrigation or toilet leaks? Those are the types of leaks we currently are cover under the program. I don't I, think. We just want to leave it. We just same. want to leave it until the new rates. Till, yeah, but at that point, maybe the fact that I like the idea of recouping the, the cost of the, of the water at a commercial rate. But we'd, I, I think right. you'd have, we'd have to see what that, what that looked like. Yeah. Okay. But that's after the rates are in. We can come back sometime after that, after yeah. February or whatever. Right. Yeah. So that we could say, okay, well, if we left it the way it is and you lost this many gallons from a leak, this is what it would cost. If you use the uniform rate or the commercial rate, this is what it would cost. So we kind of see the scale of yeah, I'm fine with waiting until we see the have the rates yeah roughly three to one but but I, yeah I, I like to see yeah. the numbers <coughs> so we're directing staff to defer revisions to the leak adjustment policy until new rates are adopted and but we are we, we are have doing a policy the unexplained unexplained we're adding use. that yeah. right okay we're calling it unexplained not an intended and I guess this will come back to us. This will come back to you as a revised adjustment policy so there'll be a hearing that will right. include the unexplained high use. Right. Okay. Okay, that sounds good. This was very easy to follow. Mm -hmm. Thank you for laying it out. So can I ask one question? I just, uh, Leslie, going back in time, I just want to be sure um, if we're going, you're going back to July 1st based on what the board direction is. I just want to know, is that going to cause a lot of um, staff time to go back because I, another alternative and I'm not sure if it's fair to entertain but is just anybody who has um, um, asked for a break that's come to the board you adjust those otherwise you just that's go right. forward with the policy I as thought it that's is. what you meant we have we have about five customers that have approached us okay with a request for unexplained high use in the last few weeks so they haven't re applied for a variance, right? But they, but we have documented that their situation is similar to the variance request we had on. This would apply to them. So does this apply to those customers as well? I think that's yeah, what we decided. yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and what I'm wondering is if you go back all the way to July 1st, which I guess isn't that far, but um, is that going to cause your staff a, a, a large amount of time to figure out who leaked and do the adjustments? Or? No. Okay. We've right. we've already we started a spreadsheet right okay. after the August twenty first right. meeting okay. to begin tracking you. those and inquiries. And you're not going to go into the water uses and say, "Oh, this is unexplained." You ne it needs to be brought to your attention yeah. by a customer, correct? Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. So I think we're done with that. Mm -hmm. We go to six four. Resolution for amendment to CalPERS. I think we don't need to talk about that very much. We're okay. going to switch if you don't mind. I don't need to read the whole Digging over? Um, you know, I think I might still stand up there. I think it would be easier for me to present up there. Tracy, I can work the uh, screen for you if you like. Okay. Don't think you need it? Okay. No. Okay, I have to switch gears a little bit, thank you. Um, I'm presenting to the board tonight um, a resolution that um, we are requesting the board approve to take to CalPERS in regards to our um, contract with the uh, Public Employees Medical and Hospital Care Act known as PEMCA. So I presented in the memo just some history on the district's um, agreement in with CalPERS retirement plan to contract services with them for their medical plans. As we know, CalPERS is the state retirement system, and one of their little adjunct duties that they do on the side is they also offer health benefits um, for agencies to contract with if they choose to. Not all CalPERS agencies who participate in the retirement plans contract with them for benefits. I think uh, there are a number um, that, that do not. Um, but those that do fall under the rules of PEMCA, which is governed by statute. Um, so it makes doing business with CalPERS in contracting for their health benefits a little bit different than if we were to go out on the market and contract um, our health benefits through a broker, let's say. 
Um, so with that, I wanted to go ahead and, and prepare or um, present to the board uh, the history in regards to the district's agreement with CalPERS to um, be part of PEMCA. We originally signed, uh, the board originally approved and adopted a resolution back in 1986, um, and resolution 8648 is attached to the memo. Um, and under that resolution, CalPERS um, uh, uh, agreed that the district would participate in enrollment and premium contributions, and as that particular um, um, resolution reads, for both active members and annuitants, which I'll refer to as retirees, it's just easier for me to say, um, and the resolution provides that the employer's contribution, it reads um, as such, as the employer's contribution shall be the amount necessary to pay the full cost of enrollment in a health benefits plan for employees and eligible, eligible dependents, um, and an annu annually graduated contribution amount for retirees until those retiree contributions are equal to those of employees. It gets a little complicated and um, I'll do my best to try and keep it clear. So we have that contract in place and it has been in place since 1986 and basically what that resolution says is that we'll pay the full cost of the benefit. What happened though is over time, um, we had negotiated, uh, an, a beginning in, in 2005, we had negotiated with our employee groups to start cost sharing the cost of the benefit, um, which we can do under our MOU. Um, we negotiated in 2005 with our mid-management and our uh, management group to do a minor cost sharing. And then in 2009, our SEIU group, our larger group, also um, agreed to that similar cost sharing um, that we had with um, that, that minimal cost sharing. And then as we all recall, who might have been here at that time, we actually agreed in 2013 with all of our groups to do more of a cost sharing. And we went to the 90% uh, coverage by the district and 10% out of pocket by employees. Um, and um, our employees and our retired uh, uh, retirees actually um, are under the same guidelines. The, the language in our retiree um, uh, MOU is that the retirees receive the same as active employees, and so the 90-10 um, cost sharing actually applies to retirees as well, except when a retiree becomes eligible for Medicare, and then the district pays for 100% of Medi uh, the Medicare plan. Um, I can't speak to what took place during the negotiations process and discussions with CalPERS in 2005, but I certainly can speak to what um, discussions took place in 2013. When we went to the 90 cost sharing plan, we actually consulted with our prior finance manager and um, Leslie and I have been working on this, um, uh, that we consulted very, um, uh, I think, very robustly knowing Michelle um, with CalPERS during, during the change um, and, and she confirmed that there were a lot of discussions that she had during um, the negotiations process about this new 90-10 um, plan that we were working on and at no time CalPERS let us know that we had any kind of issue with our current resolution. Um, so that's that's the history, um, and we have a current issue that we're trying to um, correct at this point because of some conversations that we were having with CalPERS that began back in January of 2018. Um, Leslie and I were trying to reconcile um, some billing for our retirees, and we had some questions just in regards to, to the billing process for retirees. And we needed to get some consultation from CalPERS about that question. And during that, um, in February or February of 2018, when we contacted CalPERS, we asked them the question, and we never got, we never heard back. And Leslie made it a point to keep following up and keep following up with CalPERS. And finally, in August, after another follow-up call, um, CalPERS actually responded to us and said, oh, you're fine the way that you are, everything's fine, you can go ahead and do what you wanted to do until um, that was the first call that we got and then I think it was the, the same day or the next day we received a call from CalPERS saying, oh, wait a minute, um, this was handed up to me 
um, with the CalPERS representative, uh, we were talking to staff level and it, been, it had been handed over to a compliance unit member. And she said, I think we have a problem with your current contract, the 1986 contract, because under that contract, it indicates that there'll be full, full payment um, for um, the cost of benefits and the cost sharing isn't included in that. So it caused us a little concern about what we were doing with our, um, how we needed to fix that. We were assured by CalPERS that don't worry about it, this stuff happens, we've seen it happen before, um, and what you need to do is you just need to correct it. Now CalPERS is our regulating agency, um, and in order for us to be, we, and we bargain these, um, these cost sharing plans in good faith, there was no issue in regards to how we bargained and how we came to agreement way back in 2005, 2009, and in 2014. It's just that there was an inadvertence that no one, when Michelle was talking with CalPERS, no one paid attention to that contract and she was asking the questions, but they told us we were fine. Um, what they told us this summer was we need to go ahead and, and make an amendment to your contract, to your CalPERS um, resolution, so that we can actually do what you guys have in good faith bargained for um, over the last uh, number of years. So they provided us a copy of a resolution that they said uh, we need to go ahead and bring to the board, and that resolution is presented here tonight. It's the resolution that was written by CalPERS, and CalPERS doesn't allow us to um, to change that resolution, to the wording of the resolution. And through this process, we've been working with legal counsel um, to make sure that we're walking along um, and doing things the way that we need to do and to understand our exposure, if there was any exposure um, on this. Um, what CalPERS uh, advised us to do when, when, they, when we brought it to their attention, they brought it to our attention, was they said, you know, stop your active deductions, um, your active um, employee deductions for the cost sharing until you can get this resolution into us and then you can resume that. It also, um, they also said that we needed to not have any deductions for our retirees as well. Um, so that's the fix that we're bringing tonight. Um, that CalPERS is recommending that we need to have in place in order to make our bargaining agreements that we bargain in good faith um, okay as far as they're concerned. We asked them because we were worried as our regulator, you know, as, are, are, we, are you concerned about um, any, are there any fines attached to this or, that, or do we have any audit exceptions? And they really assured us, you know, this stuff has happened before, these are old, contracts that sometimes they just put away and don't necessarily look at, but certainly need to change it now that you're bringing it to our attention and now that we know about it. They're not going backwards and looking at what we've done. If CalPERS does an audit, they actually just do it from that snapshot. So they have it on record with us that we're correcting it, we're fixing it, and if we were being audited today, then they would um, just recognize that we are working to fix that, that oversight or inadvertence. Um, any questions? I know this is gets a little complicated. Sounds like it's fixed. Anyone? Nope. I, I do want to just mention that there is an impact um, that that our retirees will, will fill. Um, we have right now the district pays Calpers the cost of the benefit directly to Calpers, and some. Um, some retirees are making contributions. I did talk about those folks who are Medicare supplement, they're paid 100%, and it, it just depends on where they're falling in that, in that kind of category. Um, right now, the retirees are actually not having anything deducted out of their retirement warrant that's issued by CalPERS for their medical benefit, because we've been paying CalPERS that. Under this new resolution, this will be, I think, the most important impact to share. Under the new resolution, we will no longer be doing that. We will only be paying the PEMCA minimum, which by statute we have to pay. Um, and deductions will be taken out of the retiree paycheck. And the district will now pay the retiree directly the cost of the benefit instead of paying CalPERS. So that's why these two, they have two options. The option that we have full pay or the cost sharing contribution 
Um, and so this will create a change with the retirees. Um, I know that we're gonna have a lot of discussion with our retirees about this change because they will see a change in their retirement um, paycheck. And so uh, we, we're putting a plan together right now to make sure that we have a really good um, outreach and opportunity to talk and explain this as much as possible to retirees as we're, as we're implementing this. These changes won't take place until November um, based upon um, uh, approval tonight of this resolution. Any questions? Anyone in the public? Anyone want to make the motion? I will make the motion to approve resolution 18-24. I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion second. Roll call, please. Um, Director LaHere? Yes. Uh, Director, um, oh, Christy's not here. Uh, Director Jaffe? Oh, Jaffe. I know as I'm out of order. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're confusing us. <laughs> We've forgotten our own names. As you've explained it, <laughs> sounds like we do not have any options, so okay. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, Director Lather? Yes. And Director Daniels? Yes. So that passes unanimously. Thanks, Tracy. Yep. Thank you. We go on to item 6.5, consider request for six month extension. While Taj is approaching, this was a this was litigation we were involved in a couple of years ago. We settled it. They originally contended they had an absolute right to a connection to a main that no longer existed. They backed off completely and said they would hook up to us and pay the appropriate fees. Now, now Taj can give them the current information that's going on up there. Yeah, I mean that. As you might know, there is a uh, county by right project at the lower part of this property that is we've been they've approached staff to talk about. But really, this is not um, for that development. This is for two existing structures that, um, you know, I suppose if there were two, you know, one is on a well right now and one is a something that's been in construction for for decades. <laughs> Uh, not not served by anything and um, so they're they're still trying to work out what the future of the property holds and I don't even know if six months is gonna you know that's what they've asked for and um, you know there are condi the conditions I think stay the same in the agreement the settlement agreement and you know I think it's up to you guys wh how you want to handle that <sighs> I recommend you do it. There's no downside to it. And they, I think what they're trying to do is they've got this development on the lower piece. And if they can work that out, then they're going to do something on the upper, which would bring in the water that would also serve this house. Mm. Okay. So there's no connect, there's no main going up to it now? No. In That's fact, they were looking at, if, if this other thing hadn't come along, they were looking at going over to Victory Lane putting a meter over there, coming across the canyon and across their property to get service just to get the right pressure. Yeah, there are mains on kind of either side of this property and it's caught kind of in the middle of a pressure zone. So we've talked at length with the developer that's proposing to do the, the development at the bottom of the hill and, and what would be required for that. It's, it's no easy, um, it's not an easy property to serve. Mm -hmm. And even these two are going to be a challenge with easements and booster stations and mm -hmm. well, well destructions. So um, they've got that ahead of them. So that's why the six months probably is not going to actually do it. Yeah, I would. I wouldn't necessarily recommend you know going beyond that because it is a settlement agreement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So. It if you're recommending not going beyond that, do the property owners know this? That it's yep. six months and then that's... That's all they've asked for. They right. only have a right right now till till November. Kay. They've asked for six months. So they didn't discuss anything beyond that. And so we're just, our recommendation is grant them the six month. I think what Taj is saying is they may come back and, and need more. I don't know what their plan, what their 
negotiations are with city ventures who is the lower unit or you know how long the upper one would take what is the settlement agreement issue if we ever were to turn it down in, in extension that is well, I don't think we have any obligation we don't have anything beyond okay. that yeah. all right well, I'll move approval of the first motion then to approve the request I'll second I have a motion and a second all in favor aye, aye. aye. opposed it's unanimous we go on to six Thank six you. except a, an award oh well hard work yeah <laughs> why do we always have this at the Rob, end oh you got it i can do something we had this at the it. beginning <laughs> no it's good to end the meeting with with a high note i know but mm -hmm. but i waited a long oh, we're time we're tired <laughs> so that's <laughs> this is going to rejuvenate you so we just get one drop is that all <laughs> So last week, um, Taj and I went out to the Water Reuse Symposium where um, a lot of regulators and other agency reps and consultants and everybody related to the water reuse industry came together. And one of the highlights of that symposium is their award ceremony. So they gave out quite a few awards, uh, the 2018, what they call National Awards for Excellence. And so Gulf Creek Water District was awarded in a category where there was only one winner. Every other category had multiple winners. This category only had one winner, which was us, for education and outreach for our mobile education trailer. So we were presented with this glass water drop that we proudly brought back and have been displaying and really sharing with our communications and outreach team, uh, Rebecca Rubin, who was instrumental in the creation of it, and then Vaidehi Campbell, who has taken this baby and really made it her own and is driving it around all over the county and it is um, going out to so many events and we are very pleased with how we're able to carry out the mission which I think came from <coughs> um, the board to not just hold events and ask people to come to us but to go out to the people so would love to share Great. this with you as well thank you I'll just, I want to add one thing. What's not shown in these pictures here that I've seen in other pictures is Melanie at her house with a circular saw, Taj's shop, quite a shop I might add, at your house, working after hours on their own, just putting in building, the, uh, you know, aspects of this. And so um, thank you both for that dedication. We've, we've gotten quite a few people um, reaching out to us this week going, now, how did you guys build that at for $8,000? <laughs> <laughs> That's I don't out. think they have the staff we have. <laughs> <laughs> you should tell them, give us $8,000, we'll tell you how we did it for $8,000. Yeah. <laughs> we would not do it again for somebody else for $8,000. <laughs> <laughs> you can rent it for a month for $8,000. <laughs> okay. I'll give this to you. Now you're giving me more to brag a, about can that. We, can yeah. we get a picture maybe of Taj and Melanie and the board up there, if you don't Sounds mind? Great. Just mm -hmm. doing that. Leslie's side job is a photographer. Yeah. Am I pro? Am I out there? Can I come and see yeah. the one minute video? Of course. Video? Sure. Of course. Yeah, connect with her. Picture yeah, her. Picture. yeah, picture first. Yeah, yeah you do. <laughs> <laughs> Can you, you know how to do that and get connected? Okay. And this is the one minute video that you showed at the National Water Reuse Conference as part of the award presentation. Yes. Yes. <laughs> no leading questions. <laughs> I was doing it for clarification, just to. I watched lots of Perry Mason, so I know. <laughs> <laughs> Darn. <laughs> oh, good sign. it might be. Get linked.
Where do you have to fill in that? Hmm. We'll uh, send, send it out. It send it out to all the board members. Technical difficulties. Yeah. <laughs> Should there be two R's there? It's water with an R, and then there's not a second R for yeah, reuse. Well, they, they no. do. No, they, no, they just, they have just one. do one. Yeah, they just they do one. Little That's okay if you email it to mm -hmm. me. I can I can brag on you at San Francisco. <laughs> and uh, we got one more thing. Uh, we adjourned. Um, Did we adjourn? <laughs> yeah. No. There's. No. A, there's. We haven't yeah, done. We yet. haven't finished. So. Oh. Letter. There's um, a letter. I think there is a motion for to accept the award. Is that what it is? There is. Oh, we have, oh yeah. We have to accept the award. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. I'll we make don't the motion. To, I'll second it. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. And Glad that passed after you already had the picture. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing, huh? <laughs> and there is one letter, item 7.1. Mr. Stallings. Are you waiting for this or not? No, we're, we're okay. Fine. Well, then we're adjourned. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs>